Please join me in a pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting, July 10th, 2017. We'll open up with the public comment period. Is anybody from the public wishing to speak? Yes, Charlie. Public, public yes, sir. Public. All right, thank you very much. I will make it very brief. I'd just like to note the passing of an over 50 year resident of Hampton. Very quiet, unassuming, shy guy. Very dignum. Uh, very fast Friday. And his, uh, his, his services are going to be at Remix Wednesday, 4 to 6. You had to know Jerry, he's a great guy. Thank you very much. Charlie, why don't we have a moment of silence in respect for that? Stand, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Announcements and community calendar. Regina. Um, I have nothing, Mr. Chairman. Rusty. Just uh, that our public safety people and our public works did an excellent job over the 4th down the beach. It was a uh, good weekend and they uh, they did the job they needed to do. Bill? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a belated happy uh, July 4th to everybody. And the condolences to the uh, Flurry family. Uh, Al Flurry uh, uh, lost his mom uh, in the last several weeks. Uh, he's right in the middle of season. He's a great business owner. He's uh, 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 a wonderful man, and it's a wonderful family. And our condolences to, uh, to the Flurry family. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rick? Yeah, I'd like to uh, send uh, regards to Marge, Jerry's wife. They were quite a team always and uh, Jerry was always my campaign manager as well as the Carl Rove of uh, Hampton he took a lot of interest in everything that went on in Hampton and everybody's gonna miss him yeah, I just like to mention that at the beach uh, the other day they had a donation of more of the wheelchairs the, with the huge tires that uh, had helped to get people on the beach and it was a great uh, great event and a great thing to do. Consent agenda. 3 Colby Street, petition for underground gas line, Unitil. <coughs> Library trustees appointment, Elizabeth Korak. License for coin operated amusement devices, Tidewater Campground, Best Western and Inn at Hampton. Pool table permit, Waters Edge Yacht Club, LLC. Road closure request, 9 Crest Street. Solicitation permit, Hampton Local 2664. And local 3017 MBA boot drive and burn boot drive. Preambulation, Exeter, Northampton, and Stratum. So moved. Second. Moved by Rusty, seconded by Regina. All in favor? Approved. Approval of minutes, June 26, 2017, non public session and public session. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. <coughs> Second. All in favor? Appointments. We have our representatives, and we had Senator Innes was going to be with us also, but we had a call this afternoon that he's been taken ill, and it's going to be unable to attend tonight, and he sends his uh, regrets that he won't be here. But we will now have uh, the four reps, if you want, the three reps that are here for uh, Mr. Oh, Bean. Bean uh, <laughs> double duty tonight, obviously. We can bring you nice soft chairs, gentlemen. Whatever you got, uh, Mr. Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we leave uh, you guys at the start? Mm -hmm. Tell us what's been going on up in Concord and how you've gotten a whole bunch more money for Hampton and <laughs> everything's going. And then we can question afterwards. You want to start, Mike, or whatever? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, as far as money for Hampton or what we have for Hampton, the good news is on the uh, the Hampton cir Circuit uh, Courthouse is that uh, they did make it through HB 25. 
which is the, you know, as you, a lot of you know, the capital budget, and it's, uh, it's supposed to be signed tomorrow, I'm told, actually signed, so uh, that, that's really good news. It was a rather precarious uh, journey it took, um, <coughs> the whole process, but uh, one of the things we had, uh, you know, Nancy Stiles was really pushing it from the very beginning, and she never let up at all, so that was uh, very sure. beneficial to the, to the town. And so right now, uh, I was checking out at the RFP, they, they haven't given the list yet of which of all the capital projects, the 125 million, which are gonna go out when, but we should know that in a couple of months. They're gonna get, go through a process and then put the RFPs out. So hopefully we'll be finding out about that in about 90 days, 100 days. So, so that would really be good. The only change to it was uh, they knocked out a little bit of the money in all the negotiation process, and that was for the furniture. And uh, we all know that everything stand up anyway. But uh, you know, re realistically, uh, if we get the building, we know we get the furniture. So um, it's, it's really a it's really a big step. Um, that's you know the biggest thing you know you know you know money wise. Some of us are following up on other stuff uh, you know with the state, whether it's uh, the DOT down at the beach. Uh, relative to crosswalks and things like that and meetings are scheduled for next week I have with some of the people to get more information on it. And sometime I'll have to be talking to some of you about it because I, I know it gets into the question of sidewalks and things like that also. So um, hopefully we can work together on it and get something done with that. Okay. Because we do have the, uh, the bridge coming up, which right now is scheduled on the priority list, the red list bridge, even though it's listed number one, it's scheduled to be actually done in 2024 right now. But then we have the 10-year the budget, excuse me, the 10-year 10, 10 review is coming up, and that's going to be discussed at that time also. So we've got to keep, keep on that to make sure it stays online. So those, are, those are some of the things. Thank you. You got, uh, the board, do you want to go around everybody and then we'll ask questions or do you want to ask questions? Well, let, them, let them go off through let them go and, and then say we'll then we'll, if we have any questions. Okay. Mike gave a shout out to Senator Stiles and I want to echo that. But I also want to say it was really important having a member of the Hampton delegation serve on the Public Works and Highway Committee who's there every minute that the, that the uh, capital budget is considered and having Mike present there for all those meetings, making sure that it didn't suddenly disappear when nobody noticed was pretty, you know, pretty important, I think. And I just want to say thanks to Mike for doing that work on behalf of the entire community as well. Um, the big, you know, obviously we, I'm sure Tracy will share his perspective on the, on the good news on the, of, the, of the budget. I have some problems with the budget more as to what's not in there than what's in, than what is. Uh, obviously, there is very little foreign aid coming from Concord to the cities and towns. Um, that was a tremendous, to me, that was a, a tremendous oversight. There's a little bit of additional money coming from meals and rooms, but not much a pittance and a, a small amount of money for some building aid that Hampton won't be eligible for. Um, just my takeaway on looking at it, uh, you know, somehow we, I thought about the fact that this, it's an it's a operating budget that includes $120 million for the Department of Corrections and $80 million for the state university system. And I just have to say, thinking long terms, I don't know when you spend half, you know, half again more money for corrections than you do for the university system, how that's much of a sustainable model, particularly if we're looking to try to have a, an economy that's gonna work, that's gonna keep, that's gonna attract our young people, um, you know, as, as part of that. Um, I was, by the work I did on the Criminal Justice Committee, um, you know, I feel pretty good about on some of the some of the reforms that we did, I approach it both from a public safety, but also from uh, trying to be smart on crime rather than, than tough on crime, and not necessarily wanting to throw money away because it's thirty-five thousand dollars a year to keep somebody in prison. I think we could oftentimes find better use for that, at a, particularly at a time when you know we have <clears throat> a serious opioid crisis. Um, that is some good news. I think that that. The state took some steps to address the kind of the, the mental health crisis that we're in, which was good. It was a great bipartisan effort. Um, to me, it's still not, you know, it doesn't bring us to where we need to be, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, and I'll just, I'll pass it on. I don't want to. Well, I'll support Nancy's uh, persistence. Uh, she had to be called the chairman of, of the committee the night before the vote uh, just to make sure. Hampton Court was still in there, and then she went to the vote the next morning at eight o'clock. So she had her foot in the back, everybody's back, I think, 
uh, right up to the vote time on that one. Because there was a chance for the courthouse to get knocked out because of Concord Steam, uh, the, the steam supplier for Concord uh, went out of business. Uh, and so there's, there's no hot water in the Concord Hospital, little things like that. So we were afraid the funds were going to get diverted. And the chairman of finance in the Senate, they had a courthouse on the docket too. So we're, we're kind of worried about if one of them has to go, which one goes? And neither one of them ended up going, so that, that's a good thing. Um, there, is some, there is additional funding coming Hampton's way. Uh, the uh, finance passed a, it, they're calling it Kino Garden, isn't that the term? Kino it's Garden. Kindergarten funded uh, some towns, 75% of the communities in the state have full day kindergarten, 25% don't primarily Ma uh, Manchester and Nashua. Uh, what, the, what the bill does is it gives $1,000 per kindergarten student as a baseline, and then the introduction of Kino was part of the bill, uh, that any revenues from Kino will add on top of the $1,100 per student. <laughs> the difference between this and adequacy, which Hampton gets no adequacy funding from the state because of our tax base, uh, this is not an adequacy payment, this is a grant. So Hampton will get these funds. Uh, they don't start coming in until the second year of the biennium, but we we will get something instead of the big goose egg we get right now from adequacy. Uh, the Keno bill itself uh, is a uh, enabling bill. The towns and uh, municipalities have to vote on it. So the question is, uh, if you if the select or select board is so inclined to put that on as a, a bill, or I'd be glad to sponsor it as a, as a citizen bill in March uh, to see if the community wants to adopt Keno. I don't know what Keno is. I know it's some kind of gambling that's done in bars, but I, I'm, I'm, I couldn't explain it to you if you asked me. Um, Fred said, what are things that are important to the citizens? That's what we want to hear about. Well, electric grills are now included with gas grills and charcoal grills as illegal to have on balconies in multifamilies. So if you've been using an electric grill, it's now illegal. Um, state is paying raises for the uh, caretaker, caregivers for developmentally disabled, uh, and the state's paying those funds, and they're going through the system, but they have to go to raises for the, for the caregivers. Um, there's additional funding for uh, opioid academic both in uh, law enforcement treatment uh, and and the state strategy uh, because of the problem with people sitting in emergency rooms that you hear about on MUR all the time um, has reorganized and it has has more funding of services out in the nine service providers uh, plus a, a roving team of, of, quote, experts that can do an evaluation so somebody doesn't have to sit in an emergency room for a month in order to get into the Concord Hospital. Uh, so I think that that's a plus for, for the citizens. Um, the new, there's a uh, DRED was split apart into two uh, departments, uh, uh, economic development and, tra and tourism, and the other one is called uh, Parks and Cultural Affairs. Uh, uh, Commissioner Rose is going to continue with that particular side of, the, of, the, of that particular new department. Um, so he, he'll have less to do. So maybe we can get a little more attention uh, for, for the park, uh, for Hampton Beach. We'll see. Uh, drug courts are uh, continually to be funded. We mentioned the courthouse. There is an additional $39 million uh, earmarked for municipals, municipalities for bridges and roads. That's over the 105 million that's been the stable level. They, there's 39 million more uh, that was actually coming out of uh, last fiscal year funding. Uh, the room and meals tax, as, as Rennie mentioned, is, is staying at 2.85 percent. Uh, the Sununu Center, which is kind of an underutilized youth center, uh, ha is going to be split into two parts. One part is now going to be a drug rehabilitation center for youth so that they don't end up with adults in the Concord Hospital. So that's a, a new strategy for dealing with the youth opioid problems. Uh, business taxes, both BPT and BET, uh, will, are dropping again in FY18 and 19, 
and as, as we continue to have a, a favorable budgeting and spending process, uh, the, there's legislation has already been passed for the BET and BPT to continue to go down. The idea there is that unlike other states, like Illinois, we just raised their uh, business profits tax by about 30 percent. Uh, New Hampshire is dropping ours. It's not a lot, but at least it's going the right direction uh, in an effort to support the government's effort to attract new business. Uh, firefighters and police training continues to be paid for this by the state. Uh, there was some funding issues because uh, a lot of the funding for this came from tickets. And uh, believe it or not, the ticket volume is down. So the funding was down. And so the question was, do you start charging a, a t tuition or can, can we find the funds? And, and, and it was, funds were found, so it's going to continue to be uh, a service provided by the state. Uh, there's, there was no increase in the road toll, which is the Concord's way of saying gas tax. Uh, there's a road toll. You pay it in order to keep the roads repaired. Right now, that, that fund is running in the red. The, 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 the road toll taxes don't cover road maintenance for the state highways. This does not include the toll roads, by the way, and don't get that confused with road toll. I did for two years. Um, but the idea, the, the pressure was on to bring the road toll gas tax up uh, to the level that support uh, maintenance, but didn't happen, which is a good thing. Uh, and we, it is going to be fully funded. It's not that we're not going to fix the roads. It's that the, the road toll tax is not covering the nut right now. Uh, let me see. I think that's... I'm on finance, so everything's through the dollar prism that, that I look at. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not on a policy committee. Uh, and I think that's it. I look forward to questions. <clears throat> Representative Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, fellow board members and uh, the delegation. Uh, it's been a privilege to serve up there as a, uh, a boot, and uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed with the delegation. Uh, these three folks uh, that have worked, my comments will uh, include the delegation that, that is from Hampton and not any individual specifics. Uh, we've worked together uh, as a delegation. We've worked with our folks in Seabrook. Sorry, Rio's not here tonight. We hope Senator Innes uh, recovers quickly. Um, there has been uh, a budget passed. And when you look just to the north in Maine, when you look to Illinois, and you look at some of the malfeasance in government systems uh, throughout the nation, and uh, uh, you look at the excellence uh, of what has just occurred in Concord again and again and again, uh, the citizens of New Hampshire should be very proud. Uh, the people of Hampton should be uh, proud of these three gentlemen and uh, Mr. Chilton. Uh, the town of Hampton uh, is a significant contributor uh, to the revenue source up there. Uh, these folks have been advancing the cause of Hampton and our economic uh, contributions and our concerns. Uh, and it, it's, been, uh, it's been a fantastic experience. Uh, the legislative process, I'll get into some of the legislation that uh, we were involved with together, um, is, is of course important. But uh, aside from that, and uh, as you know as selectmen and town people, towns folks now, and taxpayers, uh, the role of the legislator transcends into the operational uh, performance of government. And what are we exactly paying for when we uh, uh, take people's money and what these government employees are doing for us? Just as we ask these questions in Hampton. And uh, the state uh, um, struggles with some aspects of that. And uh, there's been a, uh, an information process that both the town uh, uh, executive staff here has performed and this board. Um, Mr. Welch, with his department heads, uh, with uh, members of this delegation, met with the minority leader and the majority leader specifically uh, to address uh, the concerns of Hampton and our support and the infrastructure challenge and the operational challenge that exists uh, in the town of Hampton and we're thwarted in that, in that effort. So that communication process has begun. Uh, uh, Senator Stiles has done a fabulous job. Uh, Mr. Rice, Representative Rice has done a fabulous job. Rusty, you and Jim have done great work up there. Uh, and I think this is a new chapter in the way we're conducting operations up there. Additionally, uh, members of this body, members, is met with the governor and addressed uh, our concerns. And there's a tendency at, at uh, uh, any corporation, but certainly the chief executive of a $5 billion corporation uh, which is the state of New Hampshire, that that chief executive, which is Governor Sununu, uh, His Excellency doesn't get all the information. And when he was presented with Max Sullivan's uh, uh, article, front page article above the fold about the Hampton firefighters, 
uh, and our, our support down there, and there may be a tort action coming on that. Uh, that was news to him, and he was very insightful and wanted to know about the concept of that. So uh, he's listening, he's paying attention, the majority leader, the minority leader, and we work to, together in a very great bipartisan fashion. Um, Representative Cushing was quoted uh, um, by uh, National Public Radio in a, a conversation, and it's been forwarded to the governor and to the majority and minority leader about the seawall, and that's always held against Hampton. You know from the 33 document transferring the, the property to the state that that seawall really is the jurisprudence and the responsibility of highway. And Rainey, that's his baby, and uh, it's an excellent point, and then that cannot be held against revenue expenditures. Uh, it's my privilege to serve on the Labor uh, Committee. Um, that was an interesting row up there with the right to work. Uh, that is something that's been going on since 1947. It is uh, something that has been squashed in the Northeast, mercifully so. Uh, and there was a bipartisan effort to uh, kill that bill, and it was voted down. Uh, I have just finished uh, uh, a biography on Mr. Goldwater. Uh, it started in Arizona in 47, and in 1958, people are getting thrown out of office on the Republican Party because they supported it. So the more things change, the more they really don't. Uh, the legislative agenda. Uh, there is a, a young woman, uh, Mindy Messner, uh, from Rye, and uh, you young lady uh, are going to like working with her, and if you can get on some of that committee and be appointed to that. And there are myriad uh, uh, carcinogenic uh, challenges and water uh, uh, pollution uh, threats, and she has uh, passed, and many of these gentlemen have uh, co-sponsored. Uh, legislation, and that is at the very high priority. Uh, there were legislative successes. Uh, there is some challenge with uh, those that are in charge of DES. And again, the legislation transcends into what these folks that lead these agencies and how responsive they are. And there is friction not only at the state park system, but it's been expressed by some that are advancing legislation in uh, response back from those agency heads. And that, that, of course, is to be expected, and that is an obstacle to overcome in the future. I think that's the highlight of the legislation in our committee. It was right to work. Family leave is in committee. That's something that's being researched. Uh, we put out, uh, there was co-sponsorship um, of uh, fiscal notes. Uh, the meals and rooms tax revenue, of course, that's fairly flat. That's per capita. Mr. Silbert called today and mentioned the fact that there is a taxpayer that owns beach property that is not a resident, but they come in for the summer, and we're not getting that per capita charge. We put in legislation to the state, or there was a, a legislative piece. Kildon Committee uh, is all of it uh, seems to be when you're a rookie. Uh, and we wanted to know where those meals and rooms tax dollars are coming from. And, of course, that's thwarted. Uh, and we're optimistic that we'll, we'll continue that fight. Uh, the Exemption for the Water Pollution Control Act fiscal notes. Mr. Cushing has been fighting that battle for years. Others have. Uh, that is tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars that uh, does not go to towns. It's cost this town several million. There's a tort uh, issue that is currently being exploited by the town, uh, and it robs the state, the fiscal notes, say, of uh, upwards of $3 million in change every year. Over the next four years, that's almost $50 million that uh, is given to NextTerra. It's given to Franklin Pierce College that gets $50,000 per student uh, for tuition, and it goes to uh, places like Ian Houser Bush. And certainly NextTerra is not going to uh, be moving if they don't get that. Mr. Cushing has often said that this is simply a, uh, uh, a tax break to people that must simply and uh, by law have to comply with pollution control. So that, that has gone away um, in, in Kilburn Committee. We will uh, be back at that. Uh, there are partisan issues up there, and I, and I wanted to get a little granular. There was a, a member of uh, uh, the other party, if I may, and, and sent an email, and he was talking to the, uh, via email and email traffic about the pollution control, not the pollution control, but uh, the majority leader's support of uh, subsidies, and this was a biomass generator. And, uh, he was uh, saying, will you please, you know, call that back and stop doing that. And my response, uh, having been killed in committee with co-sponsors, uh, and if I may read, please. Dear Representative, thank you for your email. Your address in generic terms on this subject bill, uh, and that's our bill we talked about, 567, 
was specifically drafted and introduced to repeal that you, you request. Please see the link below for the legislation that was specifically introduced to repeal the exact thrust of your assertions. So we have this partisan issue. My point in my email response was there were half the Democrats on that committee voted against it, but then they're clamoring because um, the House Speaker uh, takes the other side of the issue. Um, tremendous success on the budget, uh, not uh, everything for everybody, but uh, rainy day fund increased um, uh, and, and some real substantial hard work. This guy uh, right here does one heck of a job, and that, that, that is a grind as you guys that are there know. But again, a privilege to serve, privilege to serve with these men. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> Questions for our reps? Um, no, actually, I think you guys are doing a great job. And what uh, Phil was saying about the state of New Hampshire and its budget and how we should all be proud, I, I totally agree with that for your work and everything you've done. And I also would like, since you're here tonight, I'm a little bit upset. You know, I, I hope that uh, the state senator is okay. But I am actually in process of drafting a letter to the state senator, the governor, all the representatives we have up in D.C. And what it's going to outline is, I think uh, actually the town manager tonight is going to be uh, in his report. We're going to be applying for a, uh, so a few dollars. From, just a few dollars tonight uh, for some major infrastructure issues we have going on. One, of course, you know, is the wastewater pipes under the marsh. Um, yeah, we can be told by, you know, all these environmental agencies what to do, but the, the problem is there's no money. We don't have the money. The state doesn't have the money. Major issues. I was down the beach pretty much all last weekend working, touristing, whatever you want to call it. We have great departments, fire, police all over it, stateside, town side. Actually saw a uh, drone video that someone did from Epi, and that I think you saw it too, that really captures what Hampton Beach is. The traffic, the people going in, spending money, paying the meters, paying the parking lots. Hampton sustains the state of New Hampshire. Whether people like that or not, they're going to start hearing it. And the state of New Hampshire is a great state to live in, work for, be representatives in because of Hampton in a major way. So I'm going to be copying all of you on this letter once I send it. I've gotten a little backlogged the past few weeks, but I will be getting that out. And I think communication to the governor, his legal counsel I'm going to include as well because I've been communicating with him. Both Senator Shaheen, Hassan, Representative Shea Porter and uh, Custer, they all need to know what's going on. They all need to know what we provide, how you're working together with us, which I really like this whole communication that we've been doing. You know, every couple months you come in, you let us know what's going on. But it needs to go up higher. And I really think that we might next year have some additional funding available that if we start working on it now, maybe we can be one of the first people in line to get it for wastewater pipes, for roads, bridges, whatever we need, I'm sure uh, the town manager can come up with a big list for us. So you're here tonight, so that's why I'm telling you, but I really think that you need to continue what you're doing at the state level, and I would really like to get up to Concord whenever you think is good and meet the people, and uh, I really, I think we can uh, do something. I got some other people I'm gonna be sending it to that are water experts. Uh, Kelly Carnes, who also used to work out of the White House, and a good friend of mine, uh, Vincent Caprio, who owns a uh, non-for-profit water innovations company. So I think we can uh, really do something, and I look forward to it. Thank you for coming in. Good to see you guys here. I know what you haven't sat in your seat over there I, for a number of years. I know what you go through. Uh, but I appreciate all you, what you do. You know, as, as Phil has said numbers time, numerous times, you know, the state has taken Hampton State Parks for you know, uh, what it is and taken a lot of the funds out of it, whether it's the, through the park system, through the rooms and meals tax, through our liquor, through the state toll road. Hampton does its share, and we got to make sure and keep that at the forefront of everybody's mind. That, you know, it's okay to, to get the money down here, but every once in a while you got to help that out down there, too. You were mentioning that you're meeting with public works, crosswalks or something? Yeah, the, um, I was approached several times by different people about the potential for that crosswalk that people talked about the years down uh, State the Park. Bridge, yeah. you know, down yep. by the South uh, State Park. 
and so I, I've been in communication with the DOT about it, and, and I and I just got in communication with it again today, try to set something up for next week. Well, why? informational, because I don't understand all of you know, the 10-year plan relative to the bridge and the approaches to it. No Absolutely. Well, why are you talking to them? Old Ocean Boulevard, which is what goes down to the state pier, right. by Uda's, by Gorns and stuff like that. Take a look at that part of that road. There are so many potholes and stuff in there. People are going to, cars are going to get damaged. And the state, and I don't know if that's DOT or if that is Port Authority. It's Port Authority. But that needs some, to be addressed there. And while we were, the, the governor was down here last week with the uh, water wheelchairs that they have, he did a little walking around. Well, while we were over at C Street, C Street on Ocean Boulevard on C Street, there are a number of potholes right next to the sidewalk, and people are walking through them, and it's a great place to turn an ankle. Uh, so the DOT, while they're there, ask them if they can take a little bit of a, a look at some of the, the area along Ocean Boulevard. I know we're not going to have the sidewalks done right now, and I know we're going to have Ocean Boulevard, but we at least need to address some of those potholes. So if we're encouraging people and wanting people to come down here and walk around, that they're not going to trip and twist an ankle. So... I'm glad you mentioned that you were going to meet them, and that way there you can bring that up. You talked about the gas, the, the electric grills. The fire department, Fourth of July week, had um, one of the one of the businesses on uh, Brown Ave. They looked out the window, and the smoke was bailing out. They went over there, and there were grills on every single floor of this apartment place. They ended up taking them off because, again, it's illegal to have them there. But people don't realize that. You gotta have your grills away from the building, and if you don't, that's what's going to happen. So, thank you. Can I just uh, piggyback on something you said uh, that I forgot? Uh, there was also a bill passed that, that allowed the liquor store to sell their property, properties in Hampton, to the Department of Transportation. Department of Transportation is going to put together, like in Hooksit, where you have the gas stations, the liquor store, the restaurants. They're going to convert those two locations to that type facilities. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's it, Hampton, these, these are the two top producing liquor stores in the state. And so uh, I guess they figure if you throw gas and food in, they can... So more know. important for them to be respectful of the people from Hampton. Well, I, 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 did, I did two years ago get the DRA to give us uh, our room and meals tax for the whole state, uh, every city and town because Portsmouth was taking credit for like 75% of all room and meals tax. And in fact, it's like 19%. Who, who quibbles? What was Hampton? Do you remember? I don't remember. I, <laughs> I'll have to get the report, but I'll, I'll get another one. But I'll get that to fill too. Absolutely. To all right, yeah, I would definitely like to look at okay. that. Be curious to see. I'd like to see what rooms and meals tax, what, what rec, uh, dread, or right. the state parks. Yeah, we'd get that. Uh, road toll, so rooms and meals, that's, that's alcohol. Yeah all those things to, to find out what the real costs are. The road tolls of uh, 2016 Hampton Easy Pass Blue Star and Blue Star Cash are 49.5% of the total state income right. on tolls. So 50%, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. 50 is better, yeah. That's close enough. <laughs> I just mentioned about the liquor stores. They're actually, um, they went through the capital budget and they're, they're going to be fixing three of them. The, the two in Hampton and the one in Portsmouth. And they are mm -hmm. going to be transferred, changing them into, like you said, the, like the R on 93. Visitors going through that process. So they're bonding. I think it's going to raise $22 million for that. That's 27. Through the, what? I think it was 27 for the four, three. Four. Well, I think that they, they, they changed they some of back. that. Hmm. But um, they're, uh, they, they're self-supporting, in a sense. So when they're bonded, they still, they're still bonding it to themselves, but it still goes against some ledger on the state. Right. But they still have to get permission to do that. Okay. Rick? So, um, so it is now illegal to have an electric grill? On the, on on the deck. A balcony uh, of a multifamily. Of a multifamily. Yeah, you can have it, in, you have it on the driveway. You just can't have it up in the building. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, I see that we're being... Um, you know, a lot of people are coming and raising questions about what the town can do for them or what on matters that have to do with um, 
the flooding and, you know, like we were talking earlier, it's a multifaceted problem. It's not just what the comes from the tidal marshes. It's what's draining off the street that so many of the drains the state owns don't work. And that those drains not working like they don't. In fact, I bet you that none, I, I'll be surprised if any of them work. Nope. Um, <clears throat> that just complicates the matter. Because when the people, you know, when they're already getting high tide and a low tide occasionally hitting their land and their land is wet, when that water drains off of Ocean Boulevard, it just, and it's like double uh, penalty to these people. And I think that the town, the town and the state are going to have to come up with some fast answers for these people or some suggestions. Uh, this, there's this group that has sent a letter here today. Uh, they asked for four points. One of them has to do with some assistance for parking. One of them has to do with getting um, advance warnings. Um, one of them, they're, they're asking for to provide an independent evaluation from an engineer, the Army Corps or state, of New Hampshire assistance, this evaluation would provide suggestions and options for the homeowners. The town of Hampton or the state could, what they could do to assist with protecting their homes and property. And if nothing can be done to help these people, they need to know so they can go on and do what they have to do. Uh, we have to figure out what can be done. Provide support, the, uh, the other point is provide support and assistance to the residents of these two streets that they're asking about, which are Manchester and Hobson, with permitting application process with the town and the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services to protect their properties. These could include raising their properties, their driveways, their structure, you know, their home structures. They don't know what they could do or what's going to be allowed. So this is a problem that really has to be addressed. Uh, you know, and like the, the very first one was about buying, anyone that lives in Hampton Beach knows if you live anywhere near the marsh, you need to find a place to park your car. So, if, like I've lived there for 50 years, I always have a place to park my car. You don't just leave your car there when the tide's coming in. And I think a lot of these people don't realize that. There's really, I don't think, anything the town's going to be able to do for them. Um, but if the state can do something or provide some um, uh, uh, assistance in how they can get permits, and then you know, like, one, the other one that they asked for is, is, is to warn via phone or email. All you have to do is get a uh, tie chart because, you know, these problems that are here today have been here always. I had lunch with a friend that used to live right next to uh, uh, Rusty over there on Ocean Boulevard, and she grew up down on Fellows. And she was telling me these same streets that these people are asking about have always flooded. They, she's 77 years old. They were flooding when she was seven years old. So it's probably not going to help. But if there is anything that the state can do, we need to figure this out. And I know this, the town is working on it also. Um, the other thing that I saw a lot just recently this Sunday was... The fact that the people that park north of Boar's Head can't get any, um, th you know, there's no place to get quarters for them. In one hour, I had 10 people come into my place and, you know, just to ask for quarters. And we don't even use quarters, so they're not getting any from me. I just, you know, it's like round everything off to the nearest dollar. So something really needs these people look desperate and after they've been driving around and they've driven over from Keene, i just can't understand why they something better is not happening there especially where there's money being made um the state i'm on the hampton area commission uh the piece of property that's been left out of the uh the, where they're trying to get funding to do the sidewalks and do the drains and do Ocean Boulevard over from Winn from Boar's Head to Winnicott Road has been dropped, which is, as far as I'm concerned, from someone that's lived there for 54 years, I can't stand it. I think it's awful. Mm -hmm. And for a measly $28,000 that we're, we don't have, that we can't even be part of the plan, how can they do the other area down at the other end? 
They need to continue it up to, to the North Beach. There's just no planning done here for $28,000. The state can't come up with money to make sure that we have the ability to ask for uh, more money from the federal government in the future. There are big problems here, and they're not very pretty. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I, if I respond to that, is uh, Mr. Griffin, it'll be real quick. I know we've got uh, some patient people, but uh, this, this, this uh, speaks to leadership. And this speaks to department heads. Uh, I have called for the resignation of uh, Director Bryce. I've called for the direct uh, uh, the resignation of uh, uh, Commissioner Rose. Uh, there was a quote from a representative and selectman uh, that, um, after a PowerPoint presentation, uh, that we defied anybody uh, to find something that looked uh, as the beach did in May, our own beach that Rick talks about. Uh, and again, the state parks where they're generating, there's no customer service for these, these uh, change items they need. This is an email uh, from Senator Kahn. It was on July 4th. It's from a Mr. Kentz, and he was responding that uh, there was a, a representative that defied anybody to find anything that looked as bad as Hampton Beach. He asserts that Manadnock, the state park, uh, is worse. Uh, it's a, a lengthy email. It has been uh, emailed to Chris Elms, the governor's policy advisor. Uh, the governor hopefully has been a maid. Uh, just a quick couple of highlights. For two years, park staff has been requesting a change saw backpack to carry a saw up the mountain. Concord will not approve the funds. This is for a firm, uh, the Medanoc uh, plant, that does three, uh, a half million dollars in revenue. The bathroom situation is a disgrace. There is no maintenance building. Finally, to close out, Mr. Chairman, however, steps do need to be taken to improve the condition of our park facilities and ensure their long-term viability. The park's culture seems to be one of doing the bare minimum to keep the parks operational on a day basis with no long-term vision for the plan. There is no drive to make our parks the best they can. To that end, legislation should be considered that would mandate a minimum percentage of the revenue that is generated by these parks to stay in that park system, that indigenous park system, to increase services and the infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to say one more, two more things. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is uh, that I have been working on this particular thing for six years with the Hampton Beach Area Commission, and it was discussed for the whole year, and then at the very last minute, after two years, they dropped yeah. it out. That's despite, despite that all five members of the Board of Selectmen asked that it be done at least to Winnicott Road, if not to High Street, and the three people that are elected by the Beach Precinct. So that's all, there's eight elected officials that would be, that unanimously ask that this be done. For $28,000, just isn't done. Now, and was that DOT that said that the money was uh, there? DOT is, in, is part of this, yes, uh, William Rose. Uh, is the one that made that comment at the meeting um, that it had to be dropped off. I think the excuse was that they spent $28,000 worth of something just trying to decide if Ashworth Avenue should be two ways or one way. And because they wasted too much time, they couldn't pay any attention to what's happening down on Ocean Boulevard. So this is the other part I wanted to mention. Um, <clears throat> Saturday, when we had that uh, little... Uh, what was it, uh, the, the rain blew through in about three minutes and the winds were like 60 miles an hour and it was a microburst. All of a sudden, that road filled up completely. The whole thing was water from one side to the other. It was probably this deep over on my <coughs> side. And I always said, it's one of these days someone in a wheelchair is going to be coming in. Well, guess what? She showed up right then the other day. Someone that lives at 377 Ocean Boulevard and those new condos, and she's thinking of filing a complaint um, because she wanted my building is wheelchair accessible, but they have to come in the front door, which I have used for 54 years. Uh, now it can't be used anymore when this happens because the rain splatters. So f we did manage to get her in. She had to sit in her car for a while, and uh, we we just picked her up and pulled her in, and had to bring her wheelchair in. And Chuck Rage just happened to stop for a haircut, and he was there when the lady was complaining. So if anyone has any questions, just ask him. Um, and, you know, it's, that's, that one woman is just one of the problems. Anyone that would be walking down the sidewalk to leave the beach or whatever would have had to, they wouldn't be able to walk down the road. They just couldn't. 
So then later on that night, it finally went away. I hear screaming, and I think, oh, my God, someone needs assistance. I ran outside, and it had rained again, and some people got sprayed, and they were screaming like the end of the world was there. So this happens on a regular basis, and it's something that needs to be taken care of, and it makes these other problems that everyone else has worse. Thank you. I just got you, Did you have something, Rusty? Yeah, I got a quick thing again for you, Mike, while you're talking to Public Works. Uh, we had asked for a crosswalk. <laughs> um, we, had, we had a number of complaints of a crosswalk in the area of three, uh, 591 Ocean Boulevard. There's a set of steps that go up the, the bank. And now I know they can't put a handicap accessible crosswalk there. It's a bad place. It, it's not acceptable. But we had asked for them to put in a crosswalk down by, uh, down near Little Jacks. Dumas Ave. Dumas Ave, yeah. Dumas Ave yeah. just this side of Little Jacks, so that people can cross over there. And in case they can't swim. Well, in case right. they can't they swim. Can't swim. Can't swim. Can't but they've denied putting the crosswalk in. And so, why are you talking about crosswalks? That's another one. Because there is no crosswalk from east of, I mean, south of Boys Head, up to Winnicunnet Road. There are no crosswalks there. And so th right. there should be one right there at the bottom of Boys Head. As, as Rick stated, the, along with not having any quarters, people travel a long way to walk up and right. park there to get up on there. They should have at least one place where they can get safely across the road. I never mind going to the bathroom. If I can understand, is that in the, that's in the area you're talking about? Yeah. Just north of where, where he is. Have, yeah, north of like Boys Head. Of Boys Head, so that would that where the study should be continued so that maybe right. stuff should be yeah, right. It should be more part of that. Totally realigned. It Regina, do you have something? Least, yeah, I got one thing about that same area too. <laughs> it should be done at least to Winnicott Road because that's where the people that live in Hampton right. come. Right. If you're exactly. walking from the town of Hampton, if you're walking from Regina's house and you're going down the beach, that's where you go. Which brings me to that intersect, the whole rotary, whatever it's called, at the top of Winnicott. I mean, I know that it's been brought to them before stop signs blinking yellow lights some direction on what to do there but I mean I had people messaging me this weekend saying that they live right there and they're like pretty sure that one day someone's just gonna get killed I mean and then the crosswalk the only crosswalk that's pretty much in that area mm -hmm. I mean that's that's why I go to the beach I sit right up there on that wall I mean I've seen yeah. people literally I mean I've seen accidents happen right there because traffic doesn't know what they're doing so I mean, it doesn't. It's not something that has to go in a ten-year plan. Like just go down there and like throw some signs up, yellow lights. It's dangerous, real dangerous. It's also Winnicott Road is designated what 101E. Isn't that to have yep. a state interest in it? I mean, it but, seems to me like how does it not impact road? Compact road. So we're responsible for everything on it. The Hampton taxpayers are. We know it's a yeah, state. It's got a state designation. The state needs. Well, to the state was down there the other day putting up new signs. So I don't know why they can't. Well, they, they won't put up signs, they won't put up the crosswalks, you can give them a letter if you want. Yeah. Basically, they're telling us we have to, the, the road is too dangerous to put crosswalks up because it's four lanes, and people might get hit. They can't move fast enough to cross the roadway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same story. Uh, we asked to have the existing crosswalks on North Beach painted, I think it was five years ago, and the state commissioner, the then commissioner of DOT, came back with a lengthy letter saying that we wouldn't need crosswalks there if the town of Hampton hadn't encouraged people to build houses there and cause a, a mob <laughs> scene at the summertime going to the beach. Uh, and, and if Is we want crosswalks, then, then the town can provide traffic lights at each crosswalk, and it just went on to millions and millions of dollars that the state was said they weren't, weren't willing to pay. Weren't willing to do anything. Real quick. Real quick. Crosswalks and the lights that are above them at night. I go past a lot of them and the lights on on. Who's responsible for that? That's a good question. Because yeah, state roads or Hampton Road? I've no. seen it We're responsible for on the road uh, along North Beach. We're responsible for some of the, the lights on Route 1A by agreements that were signed by the selectmen back in the 1950s. Uh, I'm just yeah, same, same and, and, and the state's responsible for others, but I'd have to I'd have to know where the location is to tell. Uh, you. I can tell you where that went. Yeah. Okay, I got a good shot. Thank you for coming in. You want to say something, Rennie? Well, the only thing is, I you know, Bill mentioned the fact that there's a hundred million dollars in the rainy day fund. To me, 
that's not, that that's nothing to be proud of because it may be fat city in Concord, but I think it's raining here in the cities and towns. I would much I rather have seen that money than distributed to the cities and towns and had my the proposal that I had on four one three to return uh, you know to the state making a contribution to municipal to public safety and to teachers just been taken up. That we that would have been an easy way to uh, you know to help provide property tax release to the towns. I just don't understand how Concord can. Okay, I, but I really don't want to get into a political discussion between. Yeah. We will. Let's just, so let's, know, let's not. I'm just, I just, no, I'm just saying. I'm, resp I'm just responding to it. I, no, no, I, I, I don't want to know. But Tracy is going to respond to you. But from a finance standpoint, having. Yeah. The rainy day fund at $100 million lowers our borrowing. Right, right, right but that's, that's a political discussion. <laughs> no. not here. Hang on. I just want to say something, if I can, yeah. at the end. <laughs> I want to thank you guys. Where's the courthouse going to be? Uh, uh, Out by the uh, park and ride. Temper Swamp. Uh, park and ride. In between the park and ride and the, and the Right, just so people go. know that. The, the, and I want to thank you guys. The courthouse parking lot is also going to be a park and ride. So it's going to be right there. Okay, I want to thank you guys for what you're doing. I don't know if people realize that in New Hampshire you have a real citizen's legislators. They get $100 a year. They get it up front, so in the first year they get $200 for their two-year term. Tax. And they get a, a lot of perks, like a right. special license plate, so people know who they are and can pinpoint them right away. <laughs> what you pay for. <laughs> yeah, what you pay for, that's right. So, I mean, you really should thank your legislators for what they do, because they do a lot for very little. And thank you very much, gentlemen, and have your political discussion outside. <laughs> <laughs> Diana Martin, Recreation Department. Hello. Nice to see you. All right, so I'm just here tonight to ask for a waiver of the purchasing policy so that I can move on with a piece of my warrant article this year, which would be the um, repair of the Tuckfield one, which is Don Butler Diamond. Diana, could you just do us a favor and explain the whole process you went through? Because we always have, you know, we have so many waivers come in, mm -hmm. so many, and I know they're all legitimate reasons. But just so you can explain, so people realize how many bids you put out there, how many contract, how many people you contract contacted, how many get back to you. Sure, sure. So I I started out by assessing a need, and then after that, um, when we put the bid together, we put the scope of services together, what needs to be done on the on the field. And then um, once that was done, we sent it to 10 applicants, plus it also goes on uh, 10 applicants, 10 um, possible bidders. And then we also put it on our warrant on our um, website and hopes that someone else might see it. It also goes to another number of publications that way, too. So um, we sent it out to bid for the three-week period or whatever it was that we sent it for. I think it was three weeks this time. Um, and we only received back one bid and one other company sent a thing that said no bid out of the 10 that were sent. So you sent 10, you had the whole period of time, you got one back. Mm -hmm. And you still need the repair work done. Yeah, and I think part of the problem with that, truthfully, is it's, it's specialized work. So there's not a lot of companies that do that. Okay. Questions? Regina? I have no questions. Rusty? No, I looked at a list of people she sent it to, and a lot of them are, are local landscapers and contractors. Yeah, I tried definitely to get yeah. local people. So, and, but if you're not getting the people to get them back to you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Yeah. Rick? Negative, Negative sir. Okay, I'll any make a motion? A motion. I'll make a motion that we uh, accept the bid from Sports, Sports Turf, Turf Specialties. Specialties. I'll second. All in favor? And that bids for how much money? $78,820. No. It's $78,000. I mean, no. $26,574.72. Yeah. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I was reading up the wrong thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> he, and he's the advisor to your, yeah. your group, isn't he? <laughs> nice. Yeah, $26,000. All right. Thank you very much. All righty. Thanks. Thank you. This is a fall project, so this will be started in the next few months. Okay. Chris Jacobs, uh, Director DPW. Good evening. So we're here for the same type of request that Diana was here for. We have bids that need to be uh, approved. Uh,
crack ceiling? Crack ceiling first on the agenda. Yes, we put out, and by the way, something we're going to try so that um, it, it becomes more um, succinct or complete, and that is I went and not only put the bid tabulation on the second page, but put the bidder's list also attached to it so you can see you know, the depth that we go to uh, reach out to people to, uh, to get uh, bids or, or responses to bids. Um, June 22nd, we did open bids uh, uh, for uh, crack sealing. It's priced out by the gallon, uh, 1083 per gallon uh, applied. Um, this would be the same company that we have currently doing our, our crack sealing work. And uh, if my memory serves me right, it went down a little bit cents per gallon, but it did go down. Um, and we're asking for uh, recommendation. Our recommendation is reward to award and asking for the board to vote for so. Uh, we're asking also for a waiver because uh, we only got two bids back out of ten requests that we sent out and we technically need three. Discussion from the board. And again, it went out to all these, you, you listed everybody it went out to, right. listed the amount you get back. Is this specialty work? I tend to think yes, in that um, <coughs> the investment of a, uh, the blower, uh, the, the router tool, if it's done properly, um, you'll look, and, and a number of them are, you know, cotton mass, uh, brain tree mass, um, further south, there's plenty of work, to be honest with you. Um, and so I think they're, uh, they just pursue certain size contracts in certain uh, communities. Maybe some of them don't want to travel, I don't know. Like one of them's from Jaffrey, another one's from Keene. Um, but we, we try and keep it open to everybody. So maybe it's just not as profitable for them to drive this far if they've got other work. Um, but uh, we try. Anybody else have any comments? Is this the same company we used last year? It is the same Perhaps. company who has been out already this company. We had them in this spring and they did some leftover work with last year's money. And when, yes, it's the same company. When we do this, can we put some signage <coughs> out? I know there were a number of issues with motorcycles. Yes, um, it was pretty slippery mm -hmm. in some places. So if we could put some signage on the roads when we do that, but mm -hmm. crack sailing has been done. At least have it up there for a couple of days because I know riding a bike, I, I felt it and I received a number of complaints. People that it, uh, it was slippery and with you know tendency to drop a bike. But I'll make the motion that we accept the bid of dollars and eighty three cents per gallon service applied to roadway pavement crack ceiling services. I'll second the motion. I'll Yep, a, a quick question, and there's sort of a, a, a limit, an end state, a cap on this. I, I get the per gallon. I didn't see that. Didn't jump out at me. So it's a some portion of our um, paving budget. We try to allocate approximately forty thousand dollars to that. Okay. Thank you. Good Maybe point. thirty. It may be thirty-eight. Thank you, sir. Which All in favor? Yes. Unanimous. Next. The second one that we had is we also on the 22nd received bids for the purchase and delivery of aggregates, and this would be sand that we use for uh, sanding the road, uh, crushed stone, uh, processed gravel. Uh, there were a number of things on the uh, bid spec. There again, we got one bid. Um, we did send out to uh, seven um, vendors of what's on our list, the same seven vendors as last year. And by the way, this is the same vendor that we have currently or had last year that we, we buy regularly buy materials from. So therefore, I'm back again asking for a waiver. Uh, the amounts, if Mr. Bean was going to ask, his uh, 13000 is that what's in our sand budget. Um, there is also money in there for some crushed stone and some processed gravel. Uh, we probably will be buying a little more process, processed gravel this year, but that would come under the roadway. It's a, a prep material for pr prior paving, depending on how we mill or excavate roads. I'll make the motion that we uh, accept the waiver from the purchasing policy. 
and employed sand and gravel. Employed yes. sand and gravel. I second. Discussion? Regina? No, I have nothing. Rusty? No. And the end state was how much? 13,000? On sand. 13,000 on sand. Rick? Which we will be buying this year. We hadn't bought any last year. But because we did use so much last year, the pile is down. We will be buying sand. Thank you. Nothing, Rick? No. All in favor? Next. Okay. Next item I have down is. Um, I have down is to, to waive the sewer fees. We have an upcoming project with the um, Hampton Academy. Um, traditionally in the past, I've noted that we have in fact waived um, the sewer connection fees for various municipal projects. In looking through the ordinance last week, I didn't see where it was very clear that literally I had the authority to, wa to waive these fees. Um, it clearly states that the board sets fees and that the director will charge fees, uh, but I don't see, you know, a, a process. And uh, I did uh, copy the uh, Ms. Murphy at the SAU about this, and I was clear to point out, and she got back to me on with a question, I'm not uh, inclined to waive the excavation permits. And the reason being is those are, uh, that is something that is typically taken out by the excavation contractor. Whoever the bottom page in stone is the, the yes, thank you, general contractor, they would hire, let's say, a Severino to do their sub work. It would, the excavation permit would actually re reside with Severino, and that's who we would ultimately hold responsible for that kind of work as far as the sewer connection, disconnection, access. And the access, fee. sewer access fee. I'll make the motion that we waive the fees for the uh, school project. Uh, to, to be more specific, as, it is yes, a, a the, waiver yes, of the sewer, sewer fees for the SA 90 Hampton Academy project. Right. Second it. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bean. Thank you, sir. Uh, last but not least, um, I believe all of you received in your packets a um, um, fancy looking sketch for Atlantic Ave uh, parking. Um, based upon responses that came in almost a year ago, uh, this department went down and we took a bunch of measurements, um, scaled off where parking spaces could fit, uh, where they couldn't fit, uh, then took the time to look at uh, our site plan review for all of Atlantic Ave. And um, there's only two properties of recent history that uh, have ever gone through a planning board process. And then we actually walked uh, last week uh, fire captain and the fire chief uh, to make sure that they could, with these spaces being utilized as you see on the plan, could they make it down? Did they have enough access? Uh, particularly because there's three multi-level structures at the very end of Atlantic Ave. And the plan that you have before you with uh, spaces A through P um, is last generated July 7th. Uh, is the layout that we all agreed to. So before I make those lines official by demarcating them with four inch white, you know, normal parking lines, uh, thought it was prudent and best to come before the board. I think this is a smart idea. I think we ought to eventually do it going down the road, do all those streets down there. Uh, I think it helps helps the people in the family. I know the first time we met with them, they thought I was down for other various reasons. Um, I did hear back from uh, the gentleman at 13, it's either 13 or 15, and he said, hey, the, the little tick marks that you made, the spaces, it's working out beautiful, everybody recognizes them. Uh, it was the first, uh, this is a couple weeks ago, and he says it was the first time they'd ever had uh, a, a non-state of confusion down there. So um, he said everybody looked at the spaces. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, move that we, uh, in accordance with the Atlantic Avenue, Hampton, New Hampshire schematic, uh, dated July 7, 2017, that we authorize public works to execute. Second. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Questions? Just quickly. High Street, <laughs> July 10th. July 10, uh, that week. This week. This week and into the beginning of next week is when, yes, they're going to take up the sidewalk. And replace the sidewalk. 
I don't know what specific date they're actually. I talked to Frank earlier today. They are coming. And the street. And then once the curbing's reset and the sidewalk's been replaced, which will take about three days, then we repave the street. Okay, because there's still a lot of people talking about that and a lot of people talking about the fact that at night, you know, they can't see that. You know, I mean, I know it's all painted around it and stuff, yeah, and, but it, it, it is kind of a dangerous situation down there. We can get some paving reflectors and possibly put those down the center of the road to help guide traffic. Okay. Yeah. Can help? All right, something, one person said to me that they love it that way because it slows everybody down. We've actually, told, we're stopped on the, the sidewalk. Yeah. And yeah. told the same thing. <laughs> yeah, very nice. All right, if there's nothing else, anybody else? No? Okay, thank you very much for coming in. Thank, thank you. you. Bernie's Bar and Grill Acoustic Review. We have two groups tonight, so Mr. Bell, is he here to speak to us? Or, so if we could hear from him first, please. Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, I'd like to abstain and uh, uh, stand away from the yes, uh, sir. chair. Thank you. Just to start, before we start, if everybody would introduce themselves, please. We'll start on the left. My name is Douglas Bell. And you are? I'm the president of Kavanaugh Tachi Associates. We're an acoustical consulting firm that has been in business since 1975. Thank you. Larry Gormley, Hopeful Phoenix Gormley and Roberts. I'm an attorney representing several of the neighbors. Okay. Uh, Patricia Murphy. I've been here a couple of times before right. I met for Haverhill. I believe I can speak for most, if not all, the neighbors. Okay, thank you very much. And Mr. Bell, you you were going to give us a report? I can give you a presentation. Uh, yes. I'm going to try to keep things brief here, um, not rehash things. Uh, you've seen uh, reports written by me on three occasions, um, and I you've reviewed reports written by um, the Al Flurry Group or by RPM Dynamics as well. Uh, just a quick, quick brief history of myself. I. I've been with Kavanaugh Tachi Associates for 28 years. Throughout that entire career, I've been involved in the review of environmental acoustics. Uh, I've worked with uh, many entertainment venues along the way and have a great deal of experience in, in, this, in this topic, in this area. Um, in the process of this project, I've reviewed reports. I've reviewed and performed sound measurements. I've met with the proponents, uh, looked at the system of the thing, and I would like to kind of briefly cover some of those areas with you. Um, I think as a starting point, we have to understand is, is that the town does have a noise ordinance here that's associated or that applies to entertainment venues such as this, uh, which distinctly states that the limits are 75 decibels DBA at the lot line of the property for the hours up to 11 o'clock at night and then between 11 o'clock at night to 1 o'clock in the morning, the limit drops to 50 dBA. I find it odd that through the whole permitting process of this project, there didn't ever seem to be and never were um, conditions applied to the proponent uh, that assured compliance with these noise ordinances when it, to me, seems pretty obvious that you have a outdoor entertainment venue uh, that can produce noise that will lead into the environment. Um, there were several, two reports presented to you um, prior uh, to, or from, from RPM Dynamics, which again discussed that there was a very sophisticated sound system that was installed, uh, presumably to help control and off-site noise. And I believe that they have done a very good job of picking, selecting, and tuning this equipment. They have achieved a very, very sophisticated and very good control of the sound. However, that doesn't prevent that it from exceeding the noise limits, and there's never been any controls applied to that. Um, recently, another report was provided 
uh, to you, I think even today, a uh, very lengthy report from RPM Dynamics, uh, which I, I need to, uh, to, to respond to. I feel it's necessary. Uh, first of all, I'll agree that there were several recent modifications that even further helped to enhance and control off-site sound. Um, but then the report moves into another area, which is this discussion of, of um, the, the limits and agreements between the neighbors and the venue, uh, which suggests that during a demonstration, the sound was played at about 80 decibels at the property line, and that neighbors and others observed it and agreed that that was acceptable. I, I don't recall that to be the case, to be perfectly honest. Um, I don't know how it could be. I don't know how the neighbors or myself could suggest that exceeding the limits of the noise ordinance, how, we couldn't, how could we agree to preempt the noise ordinance? It, it, it to me, fails to, to pass what would be a, a reasonable test. But the second thing I want to discuss here that's important also to the, the board is the discussions that occur about the 50 dBA limit and its unachievability. Um, the town astutely created a threshold at some point at night when it determined that noise off-site from entertainment venues uh, needs to be controlled dramatically such that it doesn't offend the population surrounding it. Um, it shows 11 o'clock at night for this reduction in sound level limit, 75 to 50 dBA. My own personal experience, that's, that's a very late hour for that, actually. Uh, most noise regulations generally take the nighttime period as 10 p.m., and certainly over the course of my career, I've seen many live entertainment venues with curfews of 10 o'clock at night, 10.30 at night, as being the basis of when they must stop. Um, Mr. Rose, in his report, made a significant comment that 50 dBA limit is unachievable and um, you know, you'd have to stop the crashing of waves and the chirping of birds to, to achieve that. And I think that's sort of a misguided, uh, misleading statement. That the, the noise ordinance that you have applies to the entertainment venue. It doesn't apply to indigenous sources of noise. Um, in fact, I, I believe that probably the reason you try to control the noise emanating from these entertainment venues is so that the local population can enjoy some of the sounds of the indigenous sources without it being drowned out by music or other sources. The fact that it's unachievable is, is not even true. I mean, certainly an entertainment venue can control their noise to 50 dBA. Usually they build walls and doors and roofs over the structure and control the noise that way. If they have noise coming out the door, we often put a vestibule there so that there's even two doors to trap the noise. It isn't unachievable, and it, it has a reasonable basis for its its um, uh, foundation in your in your noise ordinance. Um, over the course of June, um, my firm was able to conduct measurements um, at the facility and in the surrounding community, and and you've seen the results of that. But I'd like to kind of briefly show you these results and maybe help to explain them a little bit. Um, these first measurements were made on June 2nd, a Friday night, um, and these data sets that you're looking at are sound level here, this is 60 decibels, this is 90 decibels, and this is a time interval of about five, uh, five minutes. In fact, we measured every second, and, and it, there's actually still 300 data points in here. This particular plot was taken, or this measurement was made at the east lot line of Bernie's facility, at the, at, the, at the railing of the facility. And um, as you can see, that this 75 decibel level here is exceeded quite regularly, and we've even highlighted the points where it was exceeded for 30 continuous seconds. One component of your noise ordinance is that not only does it have to exceed 70 decibels, but it must do so for a continuous period of 30 seconds. So in this case, on three instances in this five-minute period, the, the, the limits of the noise ordinance were violated. Similarly, a little later in the evening, um, another five-minute sample. This is a good example of when, uh, yeah, occasionally the levels went over 75, but never for 30 seconds. And I would submit to you that that would be demonstration of 
full compliance with your ordinance. The next week, it was a little bit warmer, more of a crowd, and the reality was is that for the most part, sound levels exceeded 75 decibels continuously at the lot line. Uh, there's one gap here. This actually, if you listen to the tapes, is when the musician stopped and they, they were introducing the next song. Recently, on the uh, 25th of June, there was a national act there. We were denied permission to the bar, so we couldn't actually make measurements at the lot line. So we made measurements across the street, um, at, near the beach walkway, near the bathhouse. So it was about 160 feet from the 125 feet, I'm sorry, from the from the property or lot line of the venue. So here's the sound level that was measured then with music playing. You can see it's at 75 and higher for most of the time. There's periods where it does drop below 75. And this is at from 10 o'clock to 1019. Music stopped at 1030, and now you can see that the levels are pretty much continuous somewhere in the order of 65 decibels. When you see a range of 75 to 65, you can assure yourself that when there's a 10 decibel increase in sound levels, all of what you've measured is coming from that source that created that. Um, decibels don't add like normal math. <laughs> you don't have a 50 decibels and add another 50 decibels and get 100. They're, they're logarithmic quantities, and so 50 and 50 equals 53. I don't want to go too deep into that. But one thing that is also true is, true is when you have 65 and 75, it equals 75. Once you get a 10 decibel gap between the background and, 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 the, and the level that you're measuring, it becomes clear. So a couple points here is, is even 125 feet away from the facility, uh, the levels are such that they are dominated by music and in excess of your ordinance on that day. Now this is during a one month period during a temporary license where presumably the facility is trying to be on its best behavior and control noise. And it, without question, any time that there is, if you can assure yourself is that if you stand in front of the facility after 11 o'clock and hear music, it's in excess of the 50 decibel limit. Um, so it, it, to me, seems that there needs to be some means um, to control or monitor the sound levels produced by this facility at its lot line to assure compliance with your ordinance. You've seen us, uh, seen paperwork presented to you of noise monitoring systems. There are systems that are out. It's, it's, it's not uncommon to use it for live entertainment venues and live performances to make sure and assure that either the promoter or that the facility is doing what they say they're going to do. And so I recommend that you consider strongly to condition any further permits to this facility on the fact that they install a live sound monitoring system which has the ability for the neighbors, the board, the chief of police, the opportunity to, to, to look at these data and say, yes, they're, they're, they're following the rules. I meant to ask, tell you, warn you that if you had any questions as I went along the line here that you should have interrupted me, but uh, if you do, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to uh, respond. Go around, Virginia. Um, no, so all, you took all the meetings were from the same spot except for the one right there because... The first two days, the data that you've seen in your reports, the first two sets of data, June 2nd and June 10th, right. the data that you've seen is from the, uh, the edge of the balcony at the, at, the, at the railing. The last set there, because we were denied access to the bar, we took the measurements across the street. And that was the night of the... Uh, I was, I was there that That's night. That's the whalers, yep. Right, the police department, I think, was also taking readings the same night of that. Um, but, okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing at this time. No, <clears throat> thank you for your report. I read it, and um, you've raised some good questions. Thank you. I also read the report and uh, see your, your figures there. Does anybody else want to speak that's at the table? I do. 
Okay. Go Thank ahead. you. And again, just to introduce you. Sure. It's, my name is Larry Gormley, and I represent a number of the neighbors. Everyone agrees that we are dealing with a unique premises. Open seven nights a week, live entertainment outdoors, proximate to residences. Other examples giving you, such as the band shell, things of that nature that are, uh, are playing music, A, are doing it in a commercial zone, and B, are ending earlier, and C, aren't seven days a week, most of the time. So this is a very unique situation. And you have a noise, noise ordinance that preceded this situation. It appears to me that <clears throat> if we knew now, knew then, when Bernie's was applying for its permits, what we know now, the planning board and or select board necessarily, in response to this hue and cry, would have limited hours and or days of playing and not provided an unrestricted right to play outdoor music seven days a week. As a result, we're now in kind of a backward situation. While the statute requires the licensee to be responsible for his creation of a nuisance, we, the abutters, have been required to plead with the town to enforce its statute. I've prepared a memo if you want, if you want to read it, um, because an issue has arisen as to how this statute should be enforced. We've recently been in, uh, informed by the Hampton Police Department that it is interpreting the statute to indicate that if someone complains, they go out there and take a measurement, which would have them running between White Island, presumably, and Boar's Head. It's simply an unworkable interpretation of the statute. The sound must be measured at its source. That is consistent with the rest of the statute, um, it is internally consistent, and most importantly, it's consistent with the legislative intent. This statute passed town meeting with overwhelming support. So if and when a court has to look at this statute, that is its lodestar. That's what a court looks at. What was the intent? And quoting from the preamble, it says the intent is to preserve the peace and quiet of Hampton. So all these abutters have been saying is, please enforce this as written. And that is why I was, I was forced to write a letter to the town attorney saying, if you don't do it, we have to do it. And we're not trying to be belligerent. We're not looking for a fight. We simply want the town to enforce a statute passed by its townspeople. Again, overwhelmingly. But it seems as though we are the ones that are, are scaling the wall. The, the report that was submitted today says, in my interpretation, Al Fleury is a great guy who has spent a lot of money. We don't dispute any of that. We have no dispute with Al Fleury, his entrepreneurial spirit, his investments in this town. We think it's terrific. But I think what has to remain in focus is that all of these other people that have come before you about this have likewise made significant investments in this town. Millions and millions of dollars in real estate investments, in property taxes. And they are now told after the fact, having had no advance notice that this was going to happen, all of a sudden they've got the sound in their living room. There are objective standards, and I respectfully submit that driving around and anecdotally saying, doesn't sound too bad to me, doesn't satisfy either the letter or the spirit of the ordinance. There is a municipal obligation to enforce the ordinance. And th there is only one way to do that, and that is by monitoring the sound. The, the other way that the board can do this is also limit days and hours. You, you have broad authority under the statute to do that. Uh, but it seems to me that there has been a great deal of talk about theory. We've got some objective evidence, but as I read the other reports, they're suggesting that there may be problems with the monitoring, there may be issues that, that could occur. Why don't we require monitoring for 60 days, the bulk of this season, 
and see what the numbers are. It will allow people to see if the ordinance is being observed, but more importantly, it will give you objective criteria by which to make a decision and to say, yes, we're doing what we're supposed to or, or, or not. Um, I, I don't see how a decision can be made short of that. You have full authority to require the licensee to monitor his premises for that period of time or, or indefinitely if, if you see fit. But it seems to me that is the only logical way that we can make decisions, the only way we can have facts. And with those facts, there can be a very clear direction about what must be done and what has been done. But to require the abutters to repeatedly come back and rehash much of, I guess, what I've said tonight, and I, I apologize to the extent that you've heard this before, but they just want the law enforced. And somebody with a cell phone saying, now it's, it's, it's good over here, you know, hundreds of yards away or half a mile away, isn't what the statute requires. And if it's appropriate, I'll hand you this memo about why I believe the statute is crystal clear that it's gotta be, it's gotta be measured at its source. And if it is measured at its, at its source, it is regularly being violated. And I just don't think anybody in good faith can shrug their shoulders at continued violations of the statute. We can't, as suggested, informally agree to change the numbers. The numbers were set at town meeting. They can't be changed without a town meeting. So I think it's very important that we have objective criteria that can be compared and decisions can be made based thereon. And with that, I will stop. Do you have any interest in seeing this memo? Let me pass it over, please. And, and just as, as your facts, to correct you, the, the seashell is seven days a week, all through the summer. Okay, but it's done at what time? Uh, it doesn't go after 11 o'clock. It doesn't, go after it doesn't 11. even go close but it to is, that. But it is seven days a week. Right. That's, I am correct, though, that that's facing the casino, right? That's directing its sound at the yeah, casino? Yeah, but there's a lot more noise there. than That's the largest generator of noise on the beach. Not from where we sit. <laughs> okay. We're not get into a back and forth right, right. now. Uh, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to back and forth. Right. I don't think, well, let's questions right now? Um, well, I just wanted to throw out there that um, just before I left tonight, Mary Lee Toomey that owns the Sea Ranch or whatever it's called there, she's been there for over 50 years. She is 100% uh, on board with your side of this argument. And she says that, you know, it is somewhat better, but with all her windows closed, all the doors closed, it's, she's in business to rent rooms through the night. Um, I'm sure she would be better off if it ended at 11, um, like the seashell, or 10, like the seashell. Um, but, you know, she's renting rooms, and it's very difficult for her. And she has fought this from before this was okayed by the zoning board and the planning board, and she wishes she could be here tonight, but she's hard working trying to keep her business going. She's had some health issues, too, I think. And I will tell you that the people at Boar's Head, they understand uh, that they're not getting the 75 uh, decimals down there. But, again, they if this ended earlier, like it did, for like it has always ended, it would be somewhat better if it was over at 11 o'clock. But they don't, they're not interested in hearing all the songs and the words to the music till 1 o'clock in the morning. Well, I, I happen to know that there are two, at least two Boar's Head um, residents here tonight. Um, and if you want to hear... That have, I can recognize some of them. They've been here for more than 50 years. Too. Yes, they have. Yes, they have. And what we've learned with the monitoring, or with having... Oh, am I not allowed to speak? No, no. You, but I'm just I'm wondering what you're going to add to it. Oh, what we've learned is if the ordinance is enforced as written with the testing being at the edge of the property of the beach bar deck, we can live with the ordinance, absolutely. 
and, and I think I speak for everybody if the ordinance is enforced as it is written. Right, and thank you for your testimony, and we're going to hear from the other side for a minute. And I think, you know, I'm not making a decision here, I'm not saying right or wrong, but it, I think it's always an interpretation of an ordinance is always, there's two interpretations usually, goes to a judge, a judge settles what the interpretation is, you know, we don't want to go that far, but there's not always, you know, an absolute right that somebody says, I know exactly what the interpretation is, and I'm not, I'm just, I'm not saying that I agree with either interpretation. I'm just saying I'd like to hear from the other side, too. I, I agree. I'm not saying that I can guarantee that we're correct, but I provide you some basis to find that I am correct, and I'm trying to obviate the time and expense for both of us to go have a judge right. do that. I agree 100%. And thank you for your testimony. And and, can, unless uh, somebody else has some other question that we could hear. Oh, go sorry. ahead. Oh, no, I'm good. Okay. I, I had one other point I wanted to make. I received um, a report from RPM. Uh, via email around 3, 30, 4 o'clock this afternoon, which asserts erroneously that on May 2nd, 2017, when we did a volume test on the system uh, at Bernie's where Mr. Uh, Bell was there, I was there, my husband was there, and a number of the other neighbors were there, as was, as was uh, the manager who was uh, seated behind Mr. Bell, uh, Jamie. I'm sorry, I don't recall his last name. There was no agreement amongst the neighbors that at the that the sound measured at the edge of the uh, property line was 80 decibels. There was no agreement. It okay. wasn't. It we had there was no live music. We had no idea what was going to be happening. I think Ms. Barnes was there as well as I recall, and. There was no consensus. There was a lot of people walking around, a lot of people having conversations, but there was no agreement. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, I'm Jim Rose, CEO for RPM Dynamics. Audio. Yeah, and I'm, uh, of course, Steve Ells, uh, appearing for Big Bernie's. Uh, Al Fleury had a previously scheduled uh, memorial service for his mother today and felt that he really had to had to be there, so he won't be here tonight. But as I understood the uh, the agenda, you were going to take testimony from experts. So yes. I thought his, uh, he had better things to do uh, tonight. Absolutely. So Jim has yeah. submitted a report, and we're just going to ask him to uh, go through it for you. I don't. Uh, I was pretty in detail with everything I, I gave to you guys, and it was given to I think handed out. Uh, the first thing, just so that I don't, f I, I know I'm correct in this, and I'm hoping that Chief Sawyer is going to remember. He was there that day when we did the ADD test, and he was part of that meeting when we got done with the testing, and the consensus was this level seems acceptable. And our conclusion was, well, then let's run the music at this level and see how it works. The first meeting we had here between everyone with the city council and myself and Bernie's and everybody, the, the chief, I think at the first meeting and the second meeting, when he was asked questions, had mentioned that the ordinance of 75 and 50 dB are unenforceable based on the fact of the levels that the beach runs at. And I think the board as a whole, including at that point when numbers weren't the big issue, the more importantly, Mrs. Murphy and, and their side of this discussion had said, the numbers are not the problem. I think we had about six people stand over there that say the numbers are not the problem. The problem is a perceived volume at our property that we're hearing music. And that w and so the concerns of the, of the council were, what can Bernie's do to alleviate that problem so that both the business can operate properly and the people that live in that area cannot be subjected to obsessive noise. Now, when the, when the PA was designed for the first season, it was designed, as my report says, full capacity, covering all of the seating in the venue. It doesn't always run that way. And when it's not full, a bunch of that sound fly by, as we found out. That being said, I spoke with Al, and we made a lot of major changes. And one of the things that keeps coming up here is Al we're talking about his pocketbook and we're not talking about his pocketbook but he did take a big hit because he tried to do everything right in the first place and he was still willing the second year to burn almost a hundred grand again to try to fix problems that the neighbors were seeing 
And that's not me, that's just Al's side of it. Um, I wrote a couple notes while I was in here today. Um, uh, one of the things was when Regina was talking earlier, she was really proud to talk to the state people here about Hampton Beach is the number one moneymaker of this state. It's the place people go, it's the things people do. 10.30 to close is the moneymaker for an entertainment bar industry. That's when people go. If you drive by any of those facilities, not just Bernie's, but Sea Catch, Boardwalk, any of those places, 7, 8 o'clock at night, you'll see there's people fluffing around. And if you drive down the strip at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, you'll notice every one of those facilities is filled to capacity. What that's telling me is I live around here. There's no way I am coming to the beach to spend $9 on a beer at that place. But if I was on vacation down here, which is a rotating people going through there, there's a large number of those people that are, wow, this Hampton Beach is awesome, that part of their thing is they want to go out at 10 o'clock till 12 o'clock, which the sound at Bernie stops, not one, to say, hey, we want to go have some drinks and have some fun and let loose, because that's the time they do it after they've spent their beach time and all that. And all of these venues are operating that way. Um, one of the other things I noticed is that we're talking about second floor metering. Uh, there's a lot of venues down there. There's places like the Sea Catch. That, and I'm not trying to throw stones at anyone. I'm just saying when they have third floor acoustic music going on, I don't see someone saying, let's go to the edge of the glass and measure on the third floor because that music is, is really irrelevant until you get down to the street. And so now we've got people standing on the, the deck of Bernie's measuring noise, which also includes ambient noise of people speaking, vehicles, and all this, which is a combination of both. Mr. Bell was correct that anywhere from 3 to 6 dB is a doubling in sound, but when you take the combination of everything, you're getting erroneous readings. The metering systems that they're talking about, I've installed them. I've worked with uh, Meadowbrook, the big venue up in, in uh, Laconia area. All of these things, the same problem. Chastain Park in Atlanta, all of these things, we've both been in the business around the same amount of time. I've been more focused on live sound. He is more well-rounded into everything. But these monitoring systems, yes, they're saying put them on the property line, but the standard purpose for them is looking for a mean difference, sort of like his last sh slide showed. When the band ended, it dropped. You're trying to see what the difference between the two is. But in standard operational hours, not uh, Sunday night at 10 o'clock when it's a Sunday, um, in standard regular hours when you're taking these readings, you're looking for... You're gonna, if cars are driving by with loud stereos, you have people yelling, you have all this on that property line, you're still going to be reading 75 dB. It's, we've figured that out by looking at phones and meters. I think all of us have figured that out. And so those numbers on that part are there. What I look at is, and as much as they didn't want to do it and they say it's more expensive, the concern on those first couple of meetings was nuisance to the neighbors. And the big nuisances are someone at Boar's Head is saying something and someone in the Bradbury Haverhill area is saying something. If you put monitoring in place for Bernie's, it means that you look at you need to put monitoring in place for every place that has entertainment. I have a USB stick because you guys aren't allowed to, uh, I guess, download from the web on your computer. So what this has is this has files on it that last night I sent one of my engineers to Hampton Beach. And they walked around with a class one court admissible certified $3,000 monitoring system. I set it to five minute LEQ at 75 dB, which is what Mr. Bell was using. And he walked around. On this stick, which I can give a Dropbox link to those guys too for it, um, he set up a microphone on the property lines of places like the Bandshell, the Playland Arcade, out in the street by the Sea Catch, in the middle of nowhere so we could kind of see where ambient. And all of these things, he ran a phone for five minutes behind the computer, showing the software running, showing the location, and showing the time. So there is no question in what is on these videos. In these videos, on the property line of the, of, the, of the band shell, it's running at an LEQ of 90 dB straight across the level. Whether or not it ends at 11 o'clock or 9 o'clock, if we're talking about 75 dB till 10 o'clock, it's still a blatant violation. The, the Playland Arcade was a standard dB of 84 LEQ. So this is saying that a, a cool place where people go bang toys and play games is running out of accordance to this RSA that was written. I don't think the RSA was written to be bad, I just think that there were a lot of things that weren't looked at, and over the time until this come up, Officer Sawyer has been saying we take this this RSA and we use it as a tool to set a boundary on, and you, you look at the conditions that are going on and you try to make it work. If there was a monitoring system on Haverhill Street, which should not be a, a, a expense to Bernie's Beach Bar, 
this would be a way to say, is he creating a nuisance? If someone calls up, and uh, another part of my thing here, jumping is, was phone calls. Complaints, there's two reasons for a complaint. One is intent and one is actual. And if I were not representing Kearney's Beach Bar, I would think that when music was playing, if I was a crooked person that I'm not, or if I was just that person that felt I needed my cause, it's worth making a phone call to put a complaint in. I'm not saying that any complaints that the police department receives are false. I'm not saying possibly they're all 100%. But given the, the, the level of what this is elevated to, the chance of every phone call that goes in there being a legitimate complaint or one that is needed to support a case. Don't insult us. I'm just. I'm wait, just wait, 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 excuse me. I'm you're, just you're giving testimony. Speak to us, please. Yeah. And when the audience, yeah. please be quiet. I'm just saying that, that I'm not, I'm saying that, that in, the, in the world we live in, I'm not blaming them, and I'm not even saying they would, but I'm saying that can happen. So looking at the numbers, there's a variable that has to be looked at is what is the importance of this thing? Because if, if this, vote or whatever it goes one way versus another it makes a big deal a lot bigger than just a little thing um that was one of the other things uh let me say uh i can't, can't read that uh the last meeting the meeting we came to in may <coughs> regina was the one who made the motion to say let's go another month or six weeks it turned into to to see how this works out because there were not enough days of testing due to weather in the first month I agreed with that. Al might not have been happy of going, oh, I wish I got my license. But even I said to him, they're correct. There were not enough days. So here we are. We're in July. We're six weeks through the summer, halfway through the summer, and no violations have been filed. None. Am I correct? Or I don't. No, um, sorry, but, but as far as I know, no violations have been, been filed regarding the noise. Uh, when the when the when the concert for the whalers happened you know the the addb we had been running i was proud to see that they were getting addbs on their number because that's what we told our guys to operate on right or wrong to the rsa here that conversation did happen when we were at the beach and even on the following conversation uh, uh miss murphy's husband was speaking with me and when he stand out there he goes yeah this is a tolerable level we've had those conversations and when looking at it for how do we make it comfortable for everyone to me, that's making it comfortable for everyone. My guys are walking around. We require them to have cell phones with an app on them with a dB meter. Might be off by a dB, but it's close. And every one of these guys is checking to make sure that railing is running at 80 dB. And they're not, they're not, maybe the RSA is 75, but if he's getting 80, he's getting 80 because that's what I told them to do. Right or wrong, at that meeting, that was the first time we met was the what we talked about. Um, on the other thing you'll see on this, of all these testings done, this was done while Bernie's was in full activity running on. And the level read in the parking lot was the lowest reading of anything we read on the beach. And this is not loaded. This is not me. I was, I was, I was mixing Melissa Etheridge's concert that night. I wasn't here. And it was one of my guys just going around. I said, I need you to take areas and just give us some readings so we have something. Um, that was one thing. Another thing when we were talking about the metering on, on property areas, like the, the, the band shell runs at a consistent 90, 95 dB all the time. And no one is complaining because it's shooting at the casino and there are no neighbors. It doesn't change the fact that it's in bigger violation than anything Bernie's is. But it doesn't change the fact because the quote that was just made at this table was, not from where I sit. Meaning that if we're looking for finding a happy medium that Al can operate as a, as a business where people are happy going there and he's bringing revenue into the city and people are going, there's this beautiful bar that we can go hang out and it's not affecting them down there. They're not complaining about the, the, the shell because it's, a, it's another half a mile down the road. So, but they're still in violation of this RSA. So having a metering system in maybe that area and maybe at Boarshead, where it's got just like in Sentinel, you know, recording data and actual audio. So there is no question about it. You can look at these numbers and you can say, is this a nuisance? Because that's what this whole big journey we've been on turned into is how do we avoid the nuisance so that the, they're happy and the businesses can operate. And uh, let's see if that's, I think that's, uh, another thing is when mentioned by uh, Mr. Bell there is you can build a building to operate at 50 dB. That's really hard to do. I mean, 50 dB is quieter than this room is right now. So if you have an air conditioner running here already, it could probably be in violation or close to it. So there's everything that's been done here, if you look through my report, Al has gone above and beyond 
trying to mitigate this problem and make sure that there are no uh, sensitivity issues down the street. And he, I think he's done a really good job at it, getting it to there. And it's not about money, it's about him making it right. Uh, Rick, the question you had last time we were here was, uh, how do we know if he gets his license that it's gonna stay making these people happy? Well, how do you know is the first thing that came up about this is Al is a good guy in the community. Al has always kept his word with you guys. He always goes above and beyond of these things. And if this doesn't work, that means we're going to be sitting here in April doing the same thing again. And I'm sure nobody here wants that. Attorney Ellis, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, just briefly. I, I hadn't planned to speak because I understood tonight was just going to be about uh, taking expert testimony. But just a couple of points. Uh, the preamble to the ordinance uh, also includes uh, the enhancement of the prosperity of the town. Um, this, uh, this venue is right in the middle of the business seasonal commercial beach zone. Uh, if there was any question about why the planning board approved it, it's where else would you have it? Um, <clears throat> as, uh, as Jim has said, we ran all last year without a violation. We've run this far, to the best of our knowledge, without any violations. Um, L has done what he said he would do. He's, when confronted with these uh, complaints, and I, you know, I don't fault these folks. I don't like loud music late at night. Who does? But uh, the, the problems, it sounds to me, have been solved. Uh, through the testing, everybody said, yeah, we can live at that level. The only issue seems to be, and Mr. Bell's report really focused on the need for now that we've fixed the problem, how do we ensure, how do we monitor so that we don't have a, uh, a renewed violation? Uh, I think you've heard from our expert that the monitoring system really isn't a good idea. It's going to be more trouble than it's worth. It's going to show a, a constant read of, I was down there, I think it was Wednesday night before the fireworks, driving by Big Bernie's and between the motorcycles and I couldn't, I went by and I said, let's listen to the music. You couldn't hear anything for the motorcycles and, and the people. It was, I had forgotten it was uh, the fireworks night or I wouldn't have been there. But, uh, you know, I'm driving by saying, is, is there a band up there? So uh, the, the, only, the only alternative I would suggest, if the board feels the need for monitoring, Al has... Uh, I know on occasion already uh, retained a, a police detail uh, to work uh, the, the venue, and I think he would be totally open to uh, a police detail to monitor this thing uh, for the summer. It's, it's a short season, and uh, if, if the board and, of course, I think the chief should have something to say about it, uh, if, if he feels that that would work, and if there's manpower available, I know that's always an issue in the summer. Uh, maybe just, just you know, hiring a, a detail, one or two guys to be there. Uh, then then there's a constant monitoring. It's, it's a real live uh, person monitoring, not someone at a remote location looking at a screen uh, and saying, oh, another violation. Uh, that was either a motorcycle or it was uh, someone hitting a high note. Uh, that would be our only... Uh, suggestion if the board feels the need for further monitoring and with that i thank you for your attention I, and i just had one more small thing and it was about the the concert with the whalers concert that when that when that concert was done it was a one-day thing and al did that on purpose before the meeting came up he contacted uh city council he contacted the police and let them know i'm going to do one of these nationals and we're going to let them play at a louder level to see if this perceived volume or nuisance is a problem and I think Regina was down there and there were several officers down there and he was open to how does this sound to you I want to know are we too low that we're not as loud as the other venues and it's affecting our business up there do we have any <coughs> wiggle room to still be make our customers a little more happy but still not affect the neighbors and he invited these people to come work with him so that they could listen to it at a louder level and between the Hampton Police Department and it must have been uh, you, Regina, were down there. The levels were deemed as on on a beach at that hour of the night was acceptable. 
And for a national concert, those ones won't go past 10 o'clock. Okay, thank you. Questions? Rusty? I have it from either, either of the two experts here. With the meters, does that different, differentiate from a motorcycle going by or a crowd going by or a... If you don't have a spectrum analyzer that's looking at frequencies, it's taking a, a, either an A-weighted or a C-weighted measurement, which picks a different frequency range, and it just says it's that range. Okay. Go ahead. A meter, I agree in that the meter measures all sound that, that, it, that it occurs to it. Um, where you can differentiate is when you have a measurement without music and then with music, and you can see a change. And if you can see that change, then you can infer what the sound level of the music is. So there is means and methods to extract the typical background out. Uh, with, with the history of measurements of data that would be derived, again, at, at an appropriate location. But, again, again, I agree with him on that, except for the fact that on a be heavy beach night, ambient noise and that are so close that you're going to be spending all day looking at trying to figure out something that's riding so close to itself. And even if you had that meter either across the street or even at the glass wall, you're still going to pick up motorcycle, Absolutely. other businesses, other Absolutely. People screaming. neighbors. If, scre if there's a bachelorette party sitting at the table next to the meeting and they're hooting and hollering, that's all going to be part of that meter reading. And you're going to hear the same thing across the street if there's kids on the beach exactly. hollering and screaming. I, I'd like to submit, we, we made measurements across the street on the beach and the background sound level for that period was, 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 was below 75 the entire time, in fact it was 65 most of the time. Now occasionally a loud motorcycle goes by, that's, again, your ordinance covers that because it allows, it requires 30 continuous seconds. Uh, there are places where even at their own edge of their bar, which I think is an appropriate place because that is where the, the law should be for, where you can infer compliance even if you don't have it even if there is a background sound level that is comparable to my, my one, My one last response to that one is that the night of that concert, we were running an LEQ of 88 dB at front of house, which was three quarters away back on the deck. We knew that number was going to go up. The question was, was the higher number going to be deemed as a perceived volume that was not a nuisance? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Chief, do you want to uh, jump in here? <laughs> Yeah, but I don't think I'm going to make a lot of friends on either side. So, okay. Quite frankly, I'm you guys can that. step down. Some thank of the you. Behavior we're witnessing tonight. I will say, I'm quite dismayed uh, with some of the behavior tonight and the previous meetings when people are trying to offer their opinion and people from the audience are shouting out. It's unacceptable. That is not what Hampton meetings are about. And I just wanted to point that out as a resident. Thank you. That, that just is unacceptable. The expert reports. To sum it up, I wouldn't use either one of them in my determination as an enforcement agent for this town to bring a matter before the court. I found significant issues that they, the way they recalled conversations going, and quite frankly, very little had to do with actual sound. I was hoping that these reports would give me some insight into sound because listening to these gentlemen go back and forth, they're obviously very educated and trained in sound, which goes to my point the police department is being put in an impossible position because I don't have the training of either one of these gentlemen. And most of the reports, if you read them, don't deal with the sound. They deal with their viewpoints of how it should be enforced. I respect other people's views. I heard the Word of Council say that it's very clear that the intent of the ordinance was to be measured from there. Sir, I'm sorry to disagree with you in public, but you couldn't be more wrong because I was part of the group that put that ordinance together and that was never the intent which is also why, since this ordinance went into effect, I have spoken out about the confusing language of this ordinance. The intent was to not have what this gentleman had one of his people doing, walking around to every entertainment establishment and measuring if it's going over and then shutting it down. Why would we do that if it's not an affront to the, the abutters, causing a nuisance? Now, obviously with Bernie's, we have that issue. But if you walk down the boulevard, it's not. Again, thank you for correcting. We do have music at the band shell seven days a week. And from every study we've done, it is by far the loudest noise source in the town of Hampton. By far. It's not even close. It's louder than the club casino. It is. Well, I just wanted to answer your question. So, 
correct your statement. So these are the issues we're dealing with. There was never the intent when this ordinance was put together for officers to be walking around with a sound meter and going establishment to establishment. If we have an establishment on the west side of town, we have a brewery out there that runs entertainment. If they're blasting the music at 100 decibels and none of the abutters are complaining, why would we stop them from doing that? Why would we stop people from enjoying that music? That makes absolutely no common sense. That's not what this town is about. That's not what New Hampshire is about. It's when it becomes a nuisance to other people, which, again, I believe we have that. That's been established that this is a nuisance to these people in the neighborhood. But for people that are coming up and talking about the legislative intent, most of them aren't voters in town, and they weren't part of the process to put this together. So I don't know how they would possibly know what our legislative intent was. The intent was so when we received the complaint, the officer would go take the complaint, and the line I'm amazed that we keep leaving out because it doesn't suit our need. We read the part of A, noise levels. It shall be unlawful for any licensee to admit or cause to be admitted any noise beyond the boundaries of his, her, its premises in excess of the noise levels established in these regulations. The next one down is noise level standards. Sound from any entertainment source controlled by this ordinance shall not exceed the following limits at the nearest lot line of the receiving private or public property. You have language that conflicts. So how anybody could believe that this ordinance clearly states that we're going to measure from the, bound, from the uh, wall, just go down to the next level. It clearly shows it's confusing. The language conflicts as to where the measurement's going to be taken. When this ordinance was conceived, again, being part of the group that worked on it, the intent had always been to receive the complaint, go to the source of the complaint, and make the measurement from that location to see if the nuisance was a nuisance by town ordinance. And then it establishes the levels. I will also just throw out for, uh, I understand what I'm going to say is not a violation, but as each person has spoken, and it's just a, it's an app, but it's fairly accurate, Every person that's spoken here has been over 50 decibels. So to say that 50 decibels is controllable is, I'm sorry, I just don't agree with that. 50 decibels is not controllable. How do we determine if it's just 52 decibels of the music as opposed to the box truck driving by? I'm sure these gentlemen could do it. They're trained experts. Members of the police department aren't. And I'm not sure what part of our operation, they would recommend that we do away with so we can deal with this nuisance as opposed to dealing with teaching officers how to deal with drunk drivers, how to safely handle needles, opiates, and those other things that are life-threatening or possibly causing property damage. I don't mean to minimize the nuisance, but right now with the staffing level I have, I think this is my fourth or fifth meeting here. I've been down to the beach. I've been going out at night making <coughs> the measurements. At some point, we got to recognize this ordinance as it's currently construed, does not work for the problem that we have. That's all I have. Mm. Questions for the chief? One question I have, the noise ordinance, is that just as much for private residents as it is for? Noise ordinance is a separate ordinance. <coughs> what we're talking about is the entertainment ordinance, where somebody applies, they want to have entertainment as defined by the ordinance, and they're licensed to do so which makes it a little bit different than the noise ordinance. Somebody driving down Ocean Boulevard with a radio, if it's clearly audible from outside the vehicle, it can be construed as a violation of our noise ordinance. Squealing tires with your vehicle is a violation of the noise ordinance. Starting construction before certain hours is a violation of the noise ordinance. Because this is a licensed activity, the determination was made that we needed to have a separate ordinance because it's a licensing issue. Music from a house or... They're not a licensed establishment, so no, that wouldn't be covered by the entertainment ordinance. That would be covered by the noise ordinance or state statute for disorderly conduct. So if there's a big party uh, coming from a private home and you go in there and uh, decide that it's too noisy, what time is acceptable for them to... Uh, to not be noisy after. Well, that's a good example. What we're talking about there is the disorderly conduct statute, which is a state statute, not a town ordinance, but there, there are comparables. When we get called to a house party, obviously our biggest concern is minors and alcohol. But absent that, if it's just the noise level, 
the music has to be an affront to somebody. There has to be somebody to complain. The police cannot be the offended party. If I don't like the no noise of the music and I'm the only one hearing it, it's not going to hold up in a court of law in the state of New Hampshire. There's case law on that. The police cannot be the offended party. In the case of you having a butter that complains, I actually have to have an identifiable complainant before I can move forward. I have to have somebody willing to testify in court that at this given hour, this music was disturbing me. Okay? And be willing to testify in court to that level and the level of disturbance. Now, that's based on state statute. And what we run into here is people ask, why don't you apply the disorderly conduct statute? Because the town of Hampton has made a decision that we're going to allow entertainment, so we have licensed that activity to a certain limit by ordinance. So it's truly not a disorderly conduct issue until after legal hours, let's say somebody was up there at 3 or 4 in the morning playing music, we could arrest them for disorderly conduct at that point. But in, during the legal hours of entertainment that's allowed by our ordinance, that's what governs the noise levels. So when are the construction people allowed to make noise? What time do they have to stop? They have to stop, I believe, by 7 p.m. I, I'll have to double check the ordinance on that. We do get, uh, the last time we had a big one was when we had the construction at the rim. They were starting on the weekends as a later time that they're starting, and we were getting complaints on that, and we got them to comply. They weren't aware of it. We brought it to their attention. Now, um, this gentleman here just mentioned that um, <coughs> that he would like for people to call up when they have a complaint. But what what has to happen here for people to be able to call up and complain? Like last year when they called up and complained, they were told, I'm sorry, the Board of Selectmen has allowed uh, this to, uh, to have this license and there's nothing we can do about it. How, that's what I think all of these people, and I know the people on board said, they don't want to hear that next year. So what has to happen for them to be able to call the police station, make a complaint, and feel that their side of the issue is being dealt with? Well, what has happened this year, uh, hearing those ideas, and I don't like having people make that statement in that regard. It is a Board of Selectmen issue as the conditions you place on it. But I don't like hearing my officers telling anybody there's nothing we can do. There's always something we can do. It may not solve the problem completely, but... Um, we can go out and take a measurement. Now, the problem I have with it is I have limited equipment, limited training, and I'm sure that if I try to enforce this, enforce this either way, I write Mr. Fleury summons or any other establishment, they're going to come in with an attorney that's going to make those arguments. Some of the issues I've highlighted in a previous memo concerns with the ordinance and also what I've said tonight. The other way around, they're going to want me to enforce it. In a, in a manner which is inconsistent with what the intent of the ordinance was and what we've been doing since that ordinance was enacted. We've never taken a measurement right from that border. It's always been from the receiving property. Anytime we've been up a complaint, that's where we take the, the uh, reading from. We always have because that was the intent at the time of the ordinance. Um, I'm going to read you a quick memo I wrote to the assistant town manager prepping for tonight's meeting. Uh, I don't know if it's been shared with you yet, but I don't mind reading it right now. Uh, reference entertainment license activity at Bernie's Beach Bar. This is a summary for the entertainment license activity at Bernie's Beach Bar for the period of May 1st to today. Hampton Police Department has responded to Bernie's for 13 calls classified as disorderly conduct. Five of those calls for service were alleged violations of the entertainment license ordinance. On May 28th, 2017, at approximately 12.02 a.m., I was uh, personally monitoring through the activities at Bernie's from Haverhill Avenue. At that time, there was music coming from Bernie's in violation of the time restriction of 11.59 p.m. on outdoor entertainment. At my direction, an officer responded to Bernie's and spoke with the manager and informed them that the, they were in violation and if the music was not terminated immediately, the entertainment license for Bernie's would be revoked by the chief of police pending a hearing before the board of selectmen. Management complied, the music was terminated. The four other uh, complaints in summary are May 12th, 2017, at 10.16 p.m., complaint was received from Boar's Head. Officer investigating found the noise level not to be in violation of ordinance. June 25th, 2017, 9.54 p.m., complaint from L Street and Ocean Boulevard. <coughs> Supervisor monitored and found no levels above ordinance level. Various <coughs> meetings were taken that evening by supervisor in numerous locations with no violations of ordinance identified. July 2nd. 
complaint from Beach in front of Bernie's for blaring music. I happened to be working that day. It was Sunday before the 4th. <coughs> I arrived at Bernie's shortly after the complaint was received and took readings from the boardwalk and Haverhill Ave. No violations of ordinance were identified. I asked, uh, <coughs> dispatch advised me that the complainant would meet me there. No complainant arrived. I asked them for call back. When they called back, they found that the number that was given to them was not the number from a complainant. Nobody that answered that understood why we were calling them. July 3rd, 2017, complaint from uh, at 11.43 p.m., complaint from Haverhill Avenue. Music was uh, too loud for this time of night. Supervisor responded, determined that the music was not unreasonable at this time. So when an officer uses the term unreasonable, that was an officer I would have to speculate was not equipped with a sound meter. We only have two sound meters. And I think as uh, this gentleman said that you go out with a sound meter that's going to meet the test of quote, we're talking about $3,000 $3, per unit. I don't have that kind of money in my budget, and I don't think it's money well spent to be doing that. I mean, I, I have one of the sound meters with me because I'm down there frequently trying to monitor the situation, and I also have the corporals uh, that have them going out and doing those readings. Um, but if we're going to go into an enforcement mode on this issue, then my recommendation is we have to rework this ordinance because you have conflicting language. One says what I'm saying and what we've been doing all along, and then I understand other people's interpretation of it. But you have two places where it says it's supposed to be done from. I was there. I know what the intent was. So that's what we've been doing. Now, if we want to change the intent, then that's what we'll do. But I've received no direction in that area, and I think it's going to take a legislative change of the ordinance for that to occur. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, like we have, you mentioned something about the noise of an air conditioning. Yeah, we, the, next to our, our fire department that was recently built, the motel next to there uh, had a complaint about the air conditioning, yeah. and the town had to go out and remedy it. They had to build, they had to rebuild whatever was there so that the noise was uh, shielded from that motel. You know, I think it, it's obvious that everybody has to work together. The other part that I want to throw out there is I've been contacted by several of the other people that have live entertainment, and they are, you know, <coughs> they're happy that they don't have any complaints. And they're not happy about being held to the standard uh, of what's going on here because they never have any complaints. And I, I think if you recall, a couple of years ago, I did give a report on that. I believe I was the deputy chief at the time, and we did an analysis of the complaints regarding this ordinance. And by and far, <laughs> Bernie's was the biggest complaints we had. <laughs> but that predates Bernie's being Bernie's. That goes all the way back to other owners when it was the Lebec Rouge. It was still the biggest complaint, and it's pretty easy to see that the issues that you have at Bernie's is they have a butters that the other facilities just don't have. Most of them are facing out towards the ocean. The music doesn't come back or to the side and bother the butters. And again, we have to. It is a unique facility. It's the first all outdoor facility that we've had in this town. You've had other facilities that have the decks. They open the doors a little bit, but. That starts to curtail area. Those those venues close or slow down much earlier than Bernie's. Bernie's is probably the busiest late night spot that we have on the beach. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember, but there is a time limit for that band show. I, I'm not sure. If it's I 10 believe their, their, or mu 11. their music is usually done by ten, but that's self-imposed because you also got to remember, being the state park, they, they've declared their sovereignty that they that our town ordinance in that area doesn't apply. They don't come close to the time limits, but they are certainly walking around with a former, former member of the Board of Selectmen on more than one occasion measuring it. It is by far the loudest venue we have, and that's just by design, because if you look at the show, it's designed to project the music out. So, so when it hits you right, I mean, you can walk 15 feet and watch it drop off the chart. Well, they don't have to complain. They don't have to com uh, 
go along with the 10 o'clock thing, but they do. They, that's the, well, no, that's self-imposed. There is no 10 o'clock yeah. curfew imposed by the town, I don't believe, on any entertainment license no. in this town. But I do remember that when, um, at one point, there they really uh, held the casino to like 11 o'clock. They were asked to close the windows or this or that. That went on for years. That's a different issue, though. What you have there is that's inside entertainment. Now, when you look at the ordinance on entertainment as it pertains to indoor facilities, okay? That's why you have the outside entertainment has to end an hour before the inside, okay? The inside, you have to buffer the music inside. So if the windows are open and uh, people are complaining, like the casino, like you get, we'd notify management that your neighbors are complaining, close the windows, close the doors. And if they fail to comply, then we could have sided with them, which we've never had an establishment, once we brought it to their attention, fail to comply with that direction to close the doors and the windows. But that was the issue with the casino. They would play shows in the past. Now, they're pretty good now. They, they end their shows much earlier than they used to. Um, but in the past, when those shows would go to midnight and past, that was frequently the problem because you had a lot of cottages on the side there on F Street they would call and complain. So we would just ask them, you've got to shut the windows, you got to shut the doors, which caused them a problem because back then there was no air conditioning and it was a steam table, but that's the price of doing business if you're going to play music that way. So uh, it's different tr rules. It's true. There's much less complaining and that people have worked and worked hard to go together and there really haven't been many complaints about the noise until Bernie's came along. And now Very unique situation and, you know, again, when the, when the complaints <coughs> were the Lebec Rouge, it was always right next door because of the way the music was channeled. When Bernie's opened up, the hope was by moving the stage to the middle that the music would project straight out over the water and the unintended consequences that landed on these people, which nobody likes. And they weren't complaining before, but now they're complaining because the music landed on them when they <coughs> changed it. Okay? So the issue is what do we do about it to address it? You know, a lot of people that say enforce, 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 well, okay. Where's the training, where's the equipment, where are the officers that are going to do that? No, and, I, and I totally <coughs> disagree as to what the ordinance says and what the intent was. I was there when this thing was developed, and that was not the intent. The intent was always from the receiving property. But I understand the conflicting language. And it, it, it is true that there are people that like that don't mind the noise. There's a lady that lives on uh, Bradford Avenue. She's thrilled. She says, I don't even have to get up and get dressed anymore. I can just listen to the entertainment right here from my house. And she lives as far away as you can from here on Bradford Avenue and she feels that she's sitting front row and she likes it so everybody's not unhappy with it hey the board's not going to vote until July 24th the next meeting because we got a lot of new information tonight we're going to take all the information we understand that both sides have said things both sides there's differences of opinions on this there's differences of opinion from the chief and the board's going to look at all that information in July 24th, the next meeting. We will take a vote. So thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you for your, your uh, testimony. Thank you for your interpretations. And we will look at it all guaranteed. Excuse me, sir. Thank can, you. Can I have a moment? <coughs> Public comment was in the beginning. Are you saying that I'm not allowed to speak? Right. We're, we're, we're ending this now. I mean... We could go on forever having people talk about it. I mean, we've had the testimony, we've listened. You can come for public comment on the 24th. Yeah. Public, co public comment on the 24th. You can come in and give it then. At about 7 o'clock is always when the public comment is. What I'd like to do now, oh, Rusty just, okay, with the board here, those that are here. I'd like to move up the superintendent SAU 90 because she's been sitting here for the Hampton Academy project which is going to be very easy to deal with I apologize she's starting to look a little sleepy yeah she was so um, who wants to give us the background on Hampton Academy not a problem I'll do that don't you wait to... okay wait for everybody to go out Can we take our comments outside please and upstairs. You can hear it all the way upstairs. Yeah. Jamie will put them upstairs. Okay. Mr. Chairman, um, we, we've already given the exemption for uh, the utilities uh, for the sewer to the Hampton Academy. There is a provision in the statute, RSA 654, 
that provides either the planning board or the board of selectmen shall hold a public meeting regarding the, the uh, improvements to be made at the academy. Uh, the planning board has held that public meeting, has discussed it over and over and over again, uh, and has has approved uh, it's sort of a quasi approval vote to to, to approve it. Uh, we ask that the board of selectmen is to waive the fact that they do not wish to hold the public meeting on this subject. I make a motion that we waive it, that we do not hold the public uh, meeting on SCU 90 on the renovations. The renovations. Second. Second. All in favor? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay, there is one other item. Oh, wait, wait, what? Um, just so we don't run behind you, um, I have prepared a, the deed for the two lots that are involved and sent it off to your council. Um, we've, we've, we're at the point where we don't need the lot line adjustment proceedings before the planning board. We don't need this public hearing under 674-54. We just want you to be able to proceed and uh, follow the will of the townspeople's vote on Article 37. So uh, if you get in touch with him, and uh, I, I won't have the selectmen sign this deed tonight because I wanted to be sure that it accomplished in your mind what you needed. So if, uh, if by the next meeting, if you could let us know whether or not that suits. Okay. We know that we probably will start demolition in the middle of this month. Uh, that means that the sixth grade wing will be taken down. You saw the fencing is already up. And with all the permits and the, all the waivers, uh, I think we're really ready to go. I'm um, so pleased that the fire department and the police department have used the facility for training and drills, which is ideal for them. And, uh, Lou, thank sorry you. We kept you so long. <coughs> be multiples in your okay, attorney, sorry. Uh, dealing with 1088 Ocean Boulevard first. Request to acquire town property. Thank you, Tim. I'm going to pass a couple of plans out to make it easy to visualize what we're talking about here. My Tony Jalbert, who's the head guy over there, has talked to the members of the association and gotten their feedback on the issues. And those issues are highlighted in what you call a hot pink on the plan I gave you. There are various encroachments that have been discovered when we did our site plan. <coughs> some are minor, some are not minor. They're all in the wetlands buffer. None of them in the wetlands themselves, but they're all in the buffer. Uh, so the question is, what do we do with them? One of the ideas we've come up with is acquire the property either through a lease or by ownership. I think in this case, a lease is sufficient. Uh, they understand that it's only good for five years as we do, but it would do the trick. We, of course, would need permission from this board to allow those encroachments to stand. But uh, the association met this past weekend and decided the, the, the encroachment colored and labeled wood deck and the other encroachment, little prong off unit two, can be and should be removed. Well, we would like permission to acquire enough land to accommodate that walkway that goes behind units four and five, the encroachment off unit two, <coughs> a little tiny encroachment between units eight and nine, and that utility panel that's there, the little mm -hmm. corner of the panel where all the uh, meters are located, uh, is on town property. Conservation would like everything removed from the from the buffer, but all of the encroachments are not environmentally threatening. They're inert, uh, 
the, well, the wood deck is the kind of deck you'd see in any beach property. <coughs> Keeps your toes a little cooler when you walk around on the sand. And we have decks. We would also like to lease enough area around it to meet the setbacks if that's an issue with, with the board. And that's the extent of the request here tonight for this particular project. There is also an encroachment in the state property that you'll see in Unit 9, but that's not the board. We'll have to deal with that separately. Peter, what was the areas that you wanted to lease for purposes of setbacks? All of the... I want to be the, the wood deck between units 8 and 9 and the encroachment off unit 2. And the setback there is is, is what? Under the zoning ordinance? And the ordinance is 10 feet. Uh, the board, um, if you don't mind, go ahead. The board would have the ability to lease for up to five years property that's not needed by the town. Um, on the other hand, if something longer is wanted, then you'd have to resort to the RSA 4114A process, which involves getting input from the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission, which you've gotten, but then followed by two public hearings spaced out as required, and then a third hearing. This, we're not, we haven't done any of those three meetings. The question for tonight is, do you want to consider the up to five year lease, which the board can do, or if you don't want to consider that, do you want to consider the RSA 4114A process? And in either event, it, the board needs to understand that these encroachments did not arrive as a result of any building permits, any planning board approvals, or any um, site plan approval. They, they came without approvals, no building permits. I've checked the records on these. And of, of all the structures, only a portion of the rear lot two, only, only a lot, the lot two rear deck that encroaches is taxed to any extent. That's just the facts of it. Regina? So I would, uh, I don't have any questions right now, but I would say that we should definitely go the RSA approach if we're going to uh, move forward on this. So what, what you're saying is these decks were put and the walkways were put in without any building permits or mm -hmm. applications for building permits? That's correct. Board would have the authority if it wished to say remove them, all of them, or part of them. <coughs> and is there room if they chose to keep their walkways? <coughs> is there room to, to put it back on their property and uh, and, and get it off the encroachment? Uh, it appears uh, in in in, uh, in part yes. I mean, right. obviously they'd have to take the deck part of the deck off a of unit two. Correct. Part of the deck off unit eight. Yeah, the the uh, the wooden walk would uh, have to be would ha uh, that is um, the wood uh, as to the unit two portion that encroaches of that mm -hmm. wooden deck that sticks out. Right. There's no room to put that on the property because of the deck. Well, the the walkway ends at that deck. Uh, it appears. The, oh, I'm sorry. On unit eight, then mine. Yeah. The unit two, the the part of the uh, wooden it says boardwalk right, right, yeah. that's behind units four and five. It looks right. it looks like that could be uh, relocated onto the property. Yes, onto the property. Not the uh, the not the wood deck. That's the wood deck would have to be made smaller so it was in within that property line. Correct. And they'd have to get a building permit for it also. Correct. Mr. Bean. Uh, may I, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Ask uh, Attorney Sari a question. Sure. 
Uh, Esquire, what is your preference uh, for a, uh, um, uh, a a period certain for any easement? I think the five years would be sufficient. Thank you, sir. No other questions? <coughs> yeah, one of the things that happened here, and I would assume <coughs> that it is one of the reasons why they are off as much as they are, is <coughs> about... 20 something years ago, Russ, you'll remember when there was. They all got washed out. They all got washed out and they just rolled, they were like matchboxes floating around. Yep. So evidently, when they put them back where they were supposed to put them back, they didn't put them back in the right spot, would be my guess. <coughs> I know they had just bought two uh, Coke machines from me, and even those, they weighed a ton. They even floated away. So they had some problems there at times. Yeah, is that my, pictures of it? Yeah. My problem is, you know, that there might have been a problem there and stuff, but being the selectman's representative of the planning board and stuff, number one, why wasn't there building permits taken out? That, that to me, right away is a, is a red flag. And also, why wasn't there a site plan done for this? So, you know, my, my I mean, if there's a mistake made, and it's a mistake, that's one thing. But... You know, the worst, the, the, the biggest problem is you deal with people go and build something and then come to you and say, oh, wow, there's a problem. We built something and we didn't realize we were building it on the wrong place, but I never went to the building department. I never went to the planning board. I never, I never did what I was supposed to do. So I, I, I got to tell you the truth, I don't have any sympathy. Well, there are thousands of those in Hampton. There are, but, but that, that does not make it correct. I mean, I think when you deal with them, if somebody comes to us and says, hey, I never did this correctly. I just built it. Now I want you to correct it. I don't think it's up to us to correct it. That's my feeling. Do you guys want to add anything? Well, in fairness to the owners there, we don't know whether the current owners are the ones responsible for this or whether it was going before them or the owner before them. It just, we don't know when those ducks went in. Well, so somebody knows when the ducks came in. <laughs> Somebody was there now, you know, either the deck was there when they when they moved in or the deck wasn't there when they moved in. I mean, I just think somebody knows when the decks were there. I, th I agree with you, Jim. If, if they had canvassed the other, the other owners, they'd knock on the door and say, was this deck here back in 1972? Someone might have known. I, I don't know. And it used to be a motel. Yeah, 72 they weren't there because it was at least, it was 78, but I think it was later that when they all got washed out and moved yeah, around. Yeah, it was in the 80s. 98, well, it was 80s and 90s. Yeah. A couple of storms. So they were I wasn't there then. You weren't there. No. Yeah, I no, know the lady that owned it before. I'll find out. Had some time moving those things back to where they were. Well, the Conservation Committee is, uh, Commissioner says what? Um, their, I went down and looked at it today, yeah. Their view is that the encroachment should be removed. Whether that, whether that can realistically be done with, like, the utility panel, don't know. That one I don't believe could, but I, I would think you could... It could, you could be a lot of work. ...correct the decks so that they fit within the line. You could correct the walkway so it fits within the line. after they get a building permit. If we make the motion to have the two public hearings and then make that decision, that will probably give us time to figure out some of this stuff. Sure, to make that? I'll make the motion. To, to uh, proceed with the 4114A yes. process. Okay. I'll make the motion. I second that motion. Okay. All in favor of proceeding with the 4114? Opposed? All right, four to one. It passes. So, so do you realize what that is then? I do. I'm not sure. I mean, nothing has to be done now, right? Correct. Right. Right. Correct. Excuse me. You're going to need a plan then from someone showing what it is we're talking about acquiring from the town. Right. We don't currently have. Yeah, because right now we're just we're looking at a rough sketch of 
basically what it is. And we need to know what you what you're actually looking for. Right. Okay, five ninety five. He's got it over there. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so 595. Peter, do you want to speak to 595 or? No. One fourteen a matter. Uh, you probably all know the property. You remember the days when it was a, a restaurant. <coughs> Jerry Flynn, the the owner, is sitting next to me. His plan is to bring this property back uh, from where it is now. The property is abutted in the rear by a lot of vacant land, not the greatest land in the world uh, from a wetlands point of view with an access to that. We're looking to acquire that land uh, through the process uh, for the use of whatever we can, preferably parking out back there. We also at one time had an agreement with the abutter to acquire that property, to combine that with this property and make a, a larger type project. But uh, we have to start somewhere else <coughs> starting tonight with the town land if it's the pleasure of the board to do so. Right from the board, want to speak? I know this property pretty well. I lived next to it for 44 years. Um, the piece in question there goes, um, that was always parking lot for the restaurant that was there since, well, we moved there in 64 and it was parking lot there. So they always had had use of that property. The, the land out there, back behind there, for years was just called Owner Unknown. The town never knew who even owned it. Clam Box was the... Clam, well, before that was Bob's Pizza, and before, <laughs> before that it was the Swiss restaurant. So, um, but uh, that mm -hmm. piece of property, that is one piece of property out of all those in that area that jots in where this owner unknown land is. The house that he was speaking about that's next to that was my father's <coughs> former house and I had the one next to that. Um, years ago, 20 plus years ago, um, I mean I sold that in 2001 so, uh, but we had done a lot line adjustment back then and we went and did a uh, Warren article, it was done by Warren article uh, to allow the lot line adjustment just to square everything up up there because actually you, you take that land that's out there That was filled by the state When they put the road in when they put the original metal wall that was across the street When they when they tore all the lot the low rocks the little rocks and the hot top and everything else You dig down out in back there you're gonna find hot top and then what that hot top is from where they they dug the road So the state had filled all that in way back in 50s so that area has always been used for a parking lot just they just didn't happen to own it it was all on called owner unknown land and i think if you squared it up it would be in light to the places both to the left and right of them by four or five houses even Corinth and down there i mean it's all of those go back that far this is just this one piece of property that doesn't so i think there's a an issue there yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic to uh, what was there for years and years, and uh, um, in terms of urban renewal, if you will, um, uh, it uh, it's a way forward, and uh, I uh, support Mr. Bridal's comments. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, I will tell you that all of the people that live around there, and I, you know, we 
in my business, all we do is talk about food, <laughs> uh, even though we're not in the food business. And uh, everyone misses that place, even though it was kind of a dump. Everyone misses it. <laughs> so w this, this would be a 42? Well, what, 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 the, what can we do the, on this? The problem that uh, has been brought to my attention by the Conservation Commission is their belief that this actually is not owner unknown but rather that uh, this came to the town's ownership by virtue of a tax collector's deed back in 2008, um, formerly owned by Warren Hobbs Estate. And um, an article passed at town meeting, Article 28, back in 1994, indicated that if the town takes uh, by tax collector's deed uh, land that is um, uh, marshland that it is freshwater marshland and title that this property is <coughs> placed in the hands of the Conservation Commission if, if that if this land is that then there's a problem under RSA utilizing RSA 4114 a because uh, that statute specifically indicates that <coughs> conservation land managed and controlled by the Conservation Commission is is not is an exception to, to RSA 4114A. So there's a statutory problem. So how do we settle it? Well, uh, how this was settled when it came to the uh, conservation easement for the Cornerstone property is that uh, resort was had to the probate court because this was conservation land is deemed to be owned in trust. We had the same problem when Unitil wanted to put uh, overhead electric lines in conservation easement along uh, uh, was Route, it, 101. Route 101 coming off of uh, yeah. Church Street. Right. And uh, they had to be told, you can't use this process. For they, they even went to the legislature. The legislature wouldn't even put the bill in. Wow. I, I just got a question on, on that piece of land. Because there used to be a number of owners Part of it was owner unknown, and part of that had a, a number of owners. One of them would have been Forrest Lindahl, and the other one would have been Joe Fumara, because uh, they all had rights to part of that, because the driveway that goes in there goes to the left, and the people can drive up in. Because of, So part of that is that, too. So I think we need to look at that. If, if, I don't know if you've looked into that part of it or... Um, I remember looking at that. Actually, when you go back in the title, there talks about stables back there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and you had to have some way to get there. People were parking on that left-hand side. Right. Uh, but that that is not part of the marshland, of course. Okay. I just, but they had to have some way to get there. Right. But that's uh, that was part. You know, like I said, the state filled that whole area in. So. Yeah, hey, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So I'm, I'm reading Mark's Mark's work here, and Rusty, you you assert that uh, it um, there's fill in there. Yeah. It was a pre-existing use. It was a parking lot. Is that correct? Yep. The parking lot remnants are still there. I believe. It. If if the parking lot remnants aren't there, the the old road bed that the state dumped out there is in part of that okay. stuff. I, I, I get what you're saying about Article 28 of the 1994 town meeting uh, and all title in freshwater marshland. Um, there seems to be a, a difference of opinion, uh, both in terms of precedent and current use uh, of the, the subject land. Uh, has the Conservation Commission asserted uh, any rights uh, on this property uh, during the time uh, that the town uh, took it to the tax collector's deed? Mr. Gerald? Um, what has happened is that when the former Lujo's restaurant mm -hmm. uh, wished to utilize some spaces back there mm -hmm. uh, for the for the town, a survey was done that's been provided by Attorney Sari, which was done by Ernie Cody, mm -hmm. that showed a line of wetlands. And 
some spaces that were not in the wetlands were uh, leased on a short-term basis by the selectmen to Lupos. Not always successfully in terms of getting paid, well, but uh, we at least it was uh, it was brought before the board at, at this <coughs> uh, But it was not uh, it was still under town ownership and the conservation conservation commission to answer your question uh, complained about those spaces being leased. Okay. They actually they actually went down and, and uh, did a test hole to see what was under the underneath the gravel that was placed there and found that it was wetland material. Do we have a copy of uh, Ernie Cody's survey here? I believe that uh, Attorney Sari provided that at the outset. Yeah, I have another copy of the I think if you if you dig down anywhere on Ocean Boulevard, that that area has all been filled, yeah. and any of those houses you're going to dig down and find wetlands material. Um, well, the question is really: Is this part of the property that was acquired by tax collector's deed? That's really the question. Right. The only way you're going to find that out is do a title search and do a survey. Yeah, as we know, the tax collector's deeds are are not by meets and bounds. They simply right. say X number of acres. Against this person or that person or whoever had the title in their name at the time for the tax bill. Correct. Can we do anything tonight before there's a, a search of the deed? What's our option right now? Well, the question was whether or not to pursue the 4114A process or not to pursue it because something else should be pursued. That's the question for tonight. I think I haven't talked yet. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick. I'm so sorry. Pardon me, Mr. Chairman. Pardon me, Rick. I didn't mean for that for to stop you. I no, 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 please. I was going to make a motion, but pardon, um, pardon me. So are you suggesting that he do the same thing that they did out there uh, at the Cornerstone? Because what that was is they had to come up with other uh, uh, conservation land to donate to the town in order to get what they wanted. So is that what you're suggesting? That's that's one approach, because when, when the this actually the attorney general's office is one is an entity that's involved, not just the town, and they always look at a number of factors and they they sort of grade the situation. How much of an encroachment would this be, and what is the return? Mm -hmm. So they they look at various such approaches. Yeah, so it's that's called meaty. Mitigation. mitigation. Yes, yeah. thank you. Mitigation. mitigation. Thank you. Rick. So that's. It sounds to me like that's what he, they're looking to have you mitigate it. We obviously can't do that because he doesn't own any of that. Well, I think mitigation can be is it can be a donation. It can be. Yeah, that it can take a monetary form as well. So maybe that's something to think about. And it could be there's no mitigation. What? It could be there's no mitigation. No mitigation at all. And we're talking a relatively small piece of. Yeah. A little sliver of land out of a gigantic piece of land. Well, I was on the board when they agreed to uh, rent it to Lupo's, and uh, it was the Board of Selectmen's idea to do it, and they wanted to do it, and they felt good about it. Can you say that again, please, sir? When we were, uh, it was the Board of Selectmen's idea to make him um, lease those spots. He didn't want to lease them because he didn't have any money. Um, but uh, the neighbors were complaining, as I remember it, for some reason, and there was someone that, you know, there were a lot of problems there. And the pro, like for instance, the, uh, they used to, they had a hole in the floor, so they would wet the whole floor down and just pour the water down the hole and let it run into the marsh. And the neighbors all knew that. So the neighbors were all pissed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so they were complaining, but the Board of Selectmen looked at it as a way to make money. And that's why they did it. So, what's different this time? So, give us an out here. Give us a, somebody do. Well, so I, I, I think the the uh, cleanest way is to uh, is to uh, have the uh, applicant here uh, indicate uh, what they would offer in mitigation and see if that was something that would fly. The, the conservation commission has expressed opposition to this, as they did before. Uh, but the cleanest way for someone, especially if they're looking to have a clear title to something that they get, 
is to uh, to uh, get the town, the selectmen and conservation commission on board with an idea that includes mitigation. Can that be, may I, Mr. Chairman? Yep, can can that be included on the uh, forty-one fourteen process addressing mitigation? Um, I, I think in this case, probably n no. Why not? Because the stat, the forty-one four RSA forty-one fourteen A that I've given you a copy of, uh, accepts out conservation land. But if we then we first need to find out if it actually is a conservation land, and as Rick said, the town's already rented space there before, so that might preclude it from being conservation land. And we could have that as part of the discovery process of doing the forty-one fourteen A. Could we not? Only if you're going to do a title search and a plan. It gets gets to be a bigger. If you know what I mean, um, maybe a, a search of the property for that the, the building is located on to find out how big that lot is and actually measure it. I, I, I just see this as uh, something that was an eyesore for years and years and years. Uh, and it's gone. Uh, Rick has talked to people like that and that someone is, is going to, to do this and there's precedent um, that the town has uh, allowed that use in the past. Um, and I think there would be a different scrutiny in uh, supervision of it. And uh, I'm, I'll, I'll make the motion that we address uh, the concerns that Mark has uh, addressed and incorporate this as we have with the, the prior um, uh, folks that were just in here and uh, conduct hearings under RSA 41 colon 14A uh, for this uh, parcel. I'll second it. And I'd like to also say that this uh, gentleman, I don't really know him, um, has worked with the town, uh, although it took a lot of persuading, I think, uh, to rip the building down because it was filled with rats. And the neighbors were complaining about it over and over and over again. So they're much happier. But they also would like to see something back there. So no one likes that hole. It does have your... Uh, Rusty for selecting. I, I saw that that was still there. <laughs> all right. Uh, all, in, all in favor of Phil's motion. Unanimous. Thank so you. to go that, that route. Uh, just so uh, Peter doesn't have to keep coming back, uh, there is an item that's under uh, old business, uh, item number two. Uh, it's a vote under, under 4114A on the uh, Tuck Realty Corp. Uh, I know it's a ways down. Uh, but I would just okay, suggest that be taken up now. For okay, I, I can address that too. Thank you. Okay, let's take that up now. Uh, since the public hearings were held, uh, uh, there were some uh, corrections to be made to the D uh, uh, minor ones that uh, Peter has uh, has done. The, the problem, however, is that the board can't vote to accept a deed tonight from the particular applicant because the applicant doesn't have an ownership. Okay. They, the, the, the deed that they, the, the project owner of record is Carl Mason, and when it was approved by the planning board, and uh, to this day, Tuck Realty Corp., which is the offering entity and which is the grantor on the deed, is, is not an owner. So he can't. So we can't. So we just can't do it. No, you, you could vote to uh, accept the donation at, at the point when Tuck Realty Corp. does become the owner, if you wish. I would suggest you do that only because... This is on a three-meeting schedule. You have to start the whole process all over again if you don't. I'll make that motion that we accept it pending the uh, closing on it. Motion seconded. All in favor? Bingo. Done. And so what, what has to happen, just so you know, is that the uh, one of the conditions of the approval is that the, uh, the quit claim deed of the town is recorded with the site plan. And, of course, that means that the, they would have to be the owner at that point. Okay. I talked with the owner earlier today, Mark, um, and he understands that too, and is going to take care of that. Okay, not a problem with there. Okay, thank you. 
All right, is that all? <laughs> so let's hope so. Let's hope so. Town manager's report. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, I want everybody to please notice that uh, Drakeside Road is closed to all through traffic. The railroad abutments are in the process of being removed and the roadway reconstructed. Closure will be for an extended period of time. I understand all the trees have been cut down. Uh, they're in the process of uh, calling in cutters in order to cut the rock on the side because there are pins to the rocks, the, uh, the abutments, uh, which have to be removed in order to remove the stone off it. So it's going to be a uh, long, hard work, but it's going to progress. It's going to be done. It'll, it may be as much as 30 days before the whole project is finished, including the fill and the repavement. Uh, work on the installation of the new water main on Lafayette Road. It was discontinued this past week because of the 4th of July weekend. Uh, it will it resumed uh, the other day, and uh, uh, it's going to be off and on uh, from now until almost Labor Day before they will complete the entire project. They, they are going to have to test the existing new main that they put in. And uh, once that's certified, then they can start, they can run water to it, disconnect the old mains, and then reconnect all the individual house services uh, to the new main as they go along. So that does take some time. Uh, our animal control officer, uh, Pete McKinnon, uh, has uh, indicated that he's retiring as of August 31st, 2017, after 30 years of service for the town. And I received today a retirement notice from Teresa McGinnis, who has 43 years of service to the town, and she'll be retiring the end of J July. That's a long period of time. Uh, the town has also applied for fiscal year 2017 Clean Water State Revolving Funds totaling $17,750,000 for the wastewater treatment facility and Church Street pumping station force main upgrades. Basically, we took a, took a look at where the kitchen sink was, and we threw everything in it, and file for the money uh, to see what we're going to get. Hopefully we at least get the force mains. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Questions? What does the, exactly what does that mean? That uh, So you're hoping to get the force mains, but uh, so... Well, need to, there need, needs to be improvements to plant because the plant is, is, is getting older and things need to be replaced and reconditioned. Uh, and what we're looking at is, is doing that. Uh, and trying to get the state to pay for at least 20 percent of it, Is at least that what 17. The revolving fund part means. Yes, absolutely. And, and in the in the past, it's been even higher amounts. Yes. But now it's as low as 20 percent. Now it's as low as 20 percent. It used to be 95 percent. Yeah. So we'll be applying to the federal government too because supposedly their their funds are going to be in the month of August. It's supposed to be uh, in, uh, liberated under the new. Uh, program that the president has put before Congress, if that happens, then we're shovel ready, we're ready to go with the improvements that we need to make, we should be able to get those funds almost immediately if they're available. So we would, if, even though this is a dream wish, we'd be willing, we'd be wanting to do it if we could? It'll save $17,500,000 to taxpayers of this town, yes. We'll, we'll just settle for whatever part of it we get. Whatever we can get, we can get that, that the taxpayers won't have to pay for. We're just just happy and delighted with that idea. So once uh, we had some type of a commitment, that's when we would start looking for people to do all of this stuff. That's correct, yep. And make the plans. We wouldn't have plans until then. Actually, we've got plans to, re to, to change a lot of the materials that are down there now. It's, just, it's, it's a matter of quick pro quo and swapping stuff. Uh, we already have the construction plans for the, uh, uh, the mains to be replaced. So that's all shovel-ready material. We could start doing that tomorrow if we had the money. Thank you. Mr. Bean? Negative, sir. Thank you. Trustee? Nope. Good. Thanks. I, I would just say just quickly that, you know, people could could write to their to the congressmen and write to the senators. I'm writing saying, it all. Yeah. But, I mean, citizens <laughs> could, too, saying, I support this. Oh, yeah. And please, you know, Hampton's in need of it. So that would be a good idea. We're very right. happy to do that. Old business, proceedings. RSA 41 colon 14 dash A proceedings amend and release of town owned deed restrictions on formerly leased land. The first one, Paul M. Allen and Dana G. Morgorio, 
4A and 4B Atlantic Ave request to amend deed restriction number three. No fences may be created upon said premise other than ornamental fences of no more than three foot high. They want to install a six foot fence. I will make move that the board modify the deed restriction three regarding the fence height as contained in the quick claim deed to the town to William Calgary, Virginia Calgary dated November 18, 1985, of the recorded Rockingham County Deed Registry of Deeds, book 2575, page 1915, so that the, so that the restricted, and it will now read three, no fence will be erected upon said premises other than ornamental fence of no more than four feet in height. Second. All in favor? Done. 911 Ocean Boulevard. Oh, yeah. uh, Mrs. Kara Edder. 911 Ocean Boulevard request to amend deed restriction number four. The grantee will not erect any building upon the premise within seven feet of any boundary line. I'll make that motion. Second. Let me read the whole the thing. The motion is, I move that the board modify the first phase of deed restriction number four regarding boundary line setbacks as contained in the quick claim deed from the town to Evelyn P. Gillespie dated July 9th, 1984 and recorded in the Rockingham County Registry of Deeds, <coughs> book 2501, page 1507, which in pertinent part now reads, the grantee will not erect any buildings upon the premises within seven feet of any boundary line so that so that said part will now read the grantee will not erect any buildings upon the premises within the setbacks prescribed in the Hampton Zoning Ordinance except to the extent allowed by the Hampton Zoning Board of Adjustment by variance once said variance becomes final but leaving intact the remainder of deed restriction number four. Motion. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Passed. Very good. Nice and quick. Uh, SAU 90, we already did it in the new business. We did. Vote not to use PA-28 inventory of taxable property form for 2018. Yes, we request the board to approve that so that we don't have to mail tax, uh, tax inventory forms to every property owner in town and then have to compilate all that material. And for those who do not return them, have to have to put a penalty on their taxes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Passed. Exeter Road I-95, Route I, Route 101, road construction cost estimate acceptance. We would request the board to approve that acceptance. Yeah, I gotta find it now. Okay. Yeah, no. Place. All right, while you're looking for that, let's go to this. Seafood Festival, use of town parking lots, High Street Municipal Lot, town offices, and Old Town Hall lot on September 8th, 9th, and 10th. Make the motion. Second. All in favor? Beautiful. <laughs> I saw that one. I'm sorry, it's so starting to say, sound like the America's Cup race. <laughs> now I can't find it. It's in this pile. I just mixed all this. I know, so did I. I know it was handed out, so. Yeah, it's in the pile. I know it's here. Somebody must have it. So Paul Breen asked me if I was supporting you for Select, and I thought, what are you talking about? <laughs> he thought you were still running. Yeah, we're running to where? Too much paper. Sign that bloody list. $126,816.80. And they're doing all this work, right? Yes, sir. And that's the, that is the lump sum amount in the contingency. 
dealing with paving, paving markings, and miscellaneous requirements dealing with town property. So long as it's done in accordance with the rules. In accordance with the rules, and right. it doesn't cost the town anything. That's the purpose for the uh, bond from Opeachy, which is 126 816.80. I'll make that motion. Second. All in favor? Nice. Closing comments. Motion adjourn 2159. Second. All in favor? Sure. Good man. Don't go away. Good job, Mr. Chairman.